Sportsburst. Manufactured locally for the Carolinas. Lockdown! This is the Rob Brown Show. Get robbed! Only on the Fan Upstate. All right, ladies and gentlemen, off we go. Happy Friday morning to you. Welcome in. The Rob Brown Radio Program is on the air. This, my friends, is the Fan Upstate. Welcome in. What a day, what a day, what a day, what a day, what a day we had yesterday in day number one of the NCAA Men's Championship Basketball Tournament. What a day we have lined up for you Today is not only do we have day two on the men's side, but we have day one on the women's side as well. And we are going to get into all of that coming up later on in the show. We've got NFL news and notes we got to get to. We're going to check in on the NBA today. Greenville Triumph Captain Brandon Fricky set to join us at 840 this morning. And coming up at nine o'clock, if everything goes well, and if they are not lazy and get out of bed a nice little treat because in the 9 o'clock hour, we are going to be joined by Diesel and Cole Bryson, the new host of our new show, Wire to Wire with Diesel and Cole, that is going to be starting right here on these very same airwaves coming up next Monday. Looking forward to all those conversations and more. Again, I am Rob Brown. The pleasure is mine. Back in the network studio, guy in charge of the broadcast today. My guy, Brandon, is in charge of everything. What's up, buddy? How we feeling? Let's get it. It's Friday. Friday. Getting down on Friday. Uh, Ever again. It is Friday. <laughs> and, of course, Friday means day two of the NCAA tournament. What a day we had uh, in day number one. Uh, so far, you know, good news, good news, bad news. The good news is... Only a few of y'all uh, have seen your brackets in tatters so far. All right. Brandon, how many Sweet 16 teams did, lo- did you lose yesterday? Any? One. Just the one. Yep. Very nice. Very nice. Just the one for Brandon. Uh, I am currently down three Sweet 16 teams already. I have lost Drake, who I had moving on. Uh, Drake allowing the Washington State Cougars to come back for exactly and precisely no reason last night at all. Uh, I have lost Drake. I have lost. I did put in my bracket. Man, I got to tell you. There is nothing worse. I, I, I feel like the biggest challenge when it comes to picking brackets. I feel like the biggest challenge when it comes to picking brackets is it's very easy to overthink the bracket. And it's also very easy to underthink the bracket, right? Like, I think it takes more than just a, a, a cursory glance and, and going with a lot of chalk, et cetera. On the flip side, I think, I think we can overthink it, right? Like, I spent four days talking about how I, I really genuinely thought that the Oregon Ducks were, were going to play a better basketball game and, and, and getting uh, Dante back, what a beast that guy was for, for the Oregon Ducks yesterday against South Carolina. I thought, all right, you know, like I, I I said all week, I think Oregon's the better team. I think Oregon's in the perfect setup for an upset here. And then we started talking to Gamecock fans, and then I started listening, and I started getting into the mind a little bit of the of the of the Gamecock faithful. I started listening, and I just assumed, and I'm almost wondering if I didn't make a mistake with Clemson here today as well. We'll talk about that in a little while, but like. I got myself to a point where I bought into, okay, this team can't be that bad again. This team can't shoot that poorly again. This team can't get that confused again. This team can't come out and lay an egg like they've been laying the last couple of games of the regular season and into the SEC tournament uh, against Auburn. Yeah, they can. Yeah, they can do that. And they did do that. I... I'm disappointed. Uh, I am disappointed. Not in the loss, Brandon. I, I mean, listen, it's the NCAA tournament. Every team of this 64 team bracket, with the exception of one, is going to take a loss. Losing doesn't hurt me all that much. In fact, if anything, I look and I go, well, you could be 
uh, Kentucky, for instance, getting dropped by the Oakland Golden Grizzlies last night. Sure. What disappointed me was how completely outclassed South Carolina looked yesterday. They looked like uh, a lost puppy. Yeah, they, they were just they were just outclassed. Um, Dante was owning them on the glass. And, and, and again, like numbers wise, it's very interesting because if you looked at the numbers from this game, I don't think that you would have thought that this team didn't just lose, but got beat by, uh, got beat by 14, right? Like South Carolina shot 45% from the floor. Uh, I went in saying what? South Carolina needed to shoot upwards of 45% from deep. They did 45.8% uh, from three. Uh, they hit 12 out of 19 from the stripe. They had the only problem, I think, that got you. The only number that I think you looked at. Look, they had 17 assists to Oregon 16. They had three blocks on the game. There were a couple of numbers that ended up killing you. Number one was the rebounding, right? And this was a this was a concern for me. I got concerned that you were going to get beat on the glass, and you did. 26 rebounds to 32 rebounds for Oregon. Um, you kept them off the offensive glass. They only had five offensive rebounds. In fact, South Carolina had more offensive rebounds than Oregon did. You kept them off the offensive side of the glass, but they wiped the floor with you on the defensive side. You did not get as many second chance opportunities as I would have liked uh, as they brought down 27 defensive rebounds. 32 to 26 was your rebounding margin. Uh, you had almost an identical number of assists, uh, assists, 17 for South Carolina, 16 for Oregon. Where you got smoked uh, was, uh, was giving away turnovers. Uh, only three steals recorded by the Gamecocks, eight takeaways, and then the uh, the 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 personal foul number. Twenty two personal fouls committed by the Gamecocks to just fifteen for the Oregon Ducks. Oregon shot thirty free throws. South Carolina shot nineteen. So in the rebounding number and in the free throw disparity, that's where this game got lost. That and the fact. We we you know I I host uh I host a bunch of shows across the BetQL network and one of the guys that I get the chance to host with is a guy by the name of PJ Glasser. PJ's good dude, super smart college basketball guy. And when we were breaking down uh, the tournament and we got to this game uh, on the national level, I said, look, I think Oregon's the better team. This game comes down to whether or not South Carolina's free throw or excuse me three pointers are going through the net. I really believe that. It turns out that's not what this game came down to. I was just wrong about that. You were 11 of 24 for 46%. It's about as good as you could ask a college basketball team to come up with in this spot. The problem was the rebounding. You got out-rebounded. The problem was the turnover margin, uh, specifically giving up eight steals, eight takeaways for free to the Oregon Ducks. And Jermaine Cousinard, a former South Carolina Gamecock, PJ used the term when I was on with him this past week, he used a term that I hated when he said it. I hated when he said it, but then once I started thinking about it, and now that we are half of round one deep in the books, he used the term a narrative bet. This is a narrative bet. And I said, I, listen, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a better, I'm a gambler. I think I hate that term. I think I hate the term narrative bet. I think I hate the term narrative bet because of all the things I've ever said on the radio about gambling, which is rule number one, never bet your own team. And rule number two, never bet with your heart. Do not let your heart make selections for you. Do not let your emotion make selections for you. You will start to eat L's if you do that. And PJ said, yeah, I agree with that 99% of the time, but sometimes there are narrative bets. And I said, what do you mean by narrative bets? And he said, it's one of those things that you look at and you go, this is too good of a story for this not to happen. And 
And whether you like it or not, Jermaine Cousinard, who was a Gamecock, Jermaine Cousinard, who left South Carolina when Frank Martin got fired, he was on that uh, on that list of guys that was, you know, the 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 Frank Martin's dude, the Martin's militia of Gamecock players. When Frank Martin got let go, Jermaine Cousinard took off. He headed up to Oregon. He got a crack at his former team last night. 14 of 22, 5 of 9 from deep, went to the stripe seven times, knocked down all seven, ended up registering 40 points against his old team. That's a narrative bet. He said, this is the type of cat that in a game like this, you recognize what a story it would be if he gets this win, and you 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 make a bet based on the fact that sometimes these guys, there, there's, there's nothing on paper, nothing on paper, that says Jermaine Cousinard's having a 40-point night. He is in the history of the Pac-12. He is the fourth player in the history of the conference. He is the floor, the fourth player to record a 40-point night in the NCAA tournament. You can't, you can't, you can't account for that. Okay. That doesn't happen. That breaks precedent. History does not have those types of score lines in them. But you got you got narrative. This was a game, and, and I'm not saying I think necessarily that Jermaine Cousinard had this circled in red on the calendar. It's not to think that Jermaine Cousinard was like, let me go out there and let me get a little revenge tour going. Let me go out there and 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 show them what they were missing out on by creating an environment where I felt like I wanted to transfer and go somewhere else. But you know. Sometimes something gives you a little spark. Sometimes something gives you a little spark, and that's what appeared to have happened here. So you can't take Jermaine Cousinard getting 40 points into account. Uh, you 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 can't take into account how good Infali Dante is, right? We talked. I told you about this yesterday, Brendan. I don't know if you remember. I mentioned Dante. I think he and Cousinard were the only two players from this team. Uh, that I mentioned by name when we broke this game down yesterday. I think uh, you did, yeah. This is a guy in Fala Dante. Dante is a guy who missed a lot of time this year. He's a guy who played, I believe, in only 21 games this year. He was dealt a couple of different injuries here and there. Um, the reason that Oregon was in this tournament was because in Fala Dante came back in time for the Pac-12 championship, and Dante did throughout the Pac-12 championship exactly what he did yesterday to the South Carolina Gamecocks. He painted the glass. He kept you away from it. He killed you inside the short-range game. He knocked down everything inside of seven feet. And Fala Dante was the reason, and Jermaine Cousinard were the reasons. Now, there are still things out there that I think South Carolina can uh, can grow with. I, I think first and foremost, it is very obvious now that the recruiting slash transfer portal window objective for Lamont Paris has got to be, you got to go find a big man. You got to go find a true five. Uh, respect to BJ Mack. BJ Mack's a power forward who plays in a small big man's body. Right, And we saw that yesterday with B.J. Mack going three of five from behind the arc. He knocked down as many threes as everybody else on the team with the exception of Michi Johnson who went four of seven. And a couple of those four down the stretch were Michi inside the last 10 minutes of the second half just trying to find a way to give the Gamecocks some sort of life as we, as we, move, as we move towards the dying gasp of this basketball game, right? So uh, you, you're going to have to go find a true five, a genuine five. This team plays most of the time with three guards and a pair of forwards, not with two guards, two forwards, and a big man. So that, to me, has to be uh, a Lamont Paris objective is you have to go this recruiting season, this transfer portal season. You got to go find the big man. The second thing that was disappointing to me was uh, there was one more duck that I mentioned by name going into this game, and it was Dana Altman. It was their head coach. This guy is a fantastic March coach. This guy is a guy who understands how to squeeze 
every last drop of juice out of whatever team he's in charge of when you get to the March Madness tournament. And I'm just going to say this. Uh, let me be very clear. I love Lamont Paris. I liked the hiring when it happened. I love that they gave my dude the extension. I think he earned it. I love what this team was and is. We're going to do our South Carolina post-mortem coming up here in just a couple of minutes. I like what Lamont Paris is doing with his basketball program. He got outcoached yesterday, like a lot. He got outcoached a lot yesterday. It's like every time that Oregon came down the floor, they flashed something different at South Carolina, and the Gamecocks didn't know what to do. They started in a man. They flipped to a zone. The minute that South Carolina started catering their offense to play against that 3-2 zone that Oregon spent a solid chunk of time in, Oregon would flip right back, and they would go to a man, but it wasn't just a man. Sometimes it was a man with the uh, with the with the, with the switch philosophy. Sometimes it was a man with a fight over the top philosophy. Sometimes it was a man that was compacted down and inviting South Carolina to give shots to some of the players that were a little more cold. Sometimes it was an extended man where they were bringing defensive guys outside of the three point line and saying, "Hey." We're going to give you an opportunity to beat us inside, but you're going to have to beat us inside and not at any point to me. And again, I don't, I don't hang this on the L of Lamont Paris because there's one other thing I'm about to mention from this game that is outside of his control. But Brandon Lamont Paris got out. He got out class yesterday. He got out. Oh, hands down. He's very good March coach. So I wanted to say something about that with, with Lamont Paris you know him coming from the SoCon and the SoCon traditionally is a three point league based off everything I've seen with Furman and all the other teams, including the buckyball situation. Um, I think uh, I agree with you 100% with regards to he needs to find a big man. They should be focused more on building going on the inside versus focusing on the perimeter because the per if the perimeter, if you live and breathe by it, you're going to die all the time. Uh, especially in March. Am I right? BYU, what the hell? We'll talk about that coming up here in just – a little while from right now as well. Um, I think the other thing, the other thing, and, and, and this is something that you can't put on Lamont Paris. The South Carolina Gamecock basketball team had, I believe, somewhere between 10 and a dozen missed layups. Can't do it. If you can't knock down buckets inside of two feet with great regularity, you don't win in March. That that's a that's a that's a real real simple formula. If you are getting looks inside the restricted area, if you're getting looks in the paint, and you are losing more of them than you are winning, then you are going to lose that basketball game and every other basketball game. It's it's real simple to me. If you took, uh, if you took ten miss layups. And let's say you make seven of them layups, layups, layups inside of five feet, layups. If you make seven of those 10 missed layups, we got a tie basketball game. If you make eight out of those 10 layups, you win the game. Now, I know it's very easy to play Friday morning quarterback. I know it's very easy to sit here in the Casa de Love here at the Bro Cave. I know it's very easy to watch the highlights on the 75 inch and go, oh, well, you're missing your layups and that's going to cost you. But uh, my friends, my fam, let's call this what it is, Brandon. Sometimes obvious things are obvious and that was obvious. If you can't adjust to an offense, to excuse me, to a defense, if you can't adjust your offense to a defense that gives you a different look every two or three possessions. And if you are missing 10 five-footers or closer, you're going to lose when it comes March Madness. You can get away with that when you got Western Kentucky coming to town. You can get away with that when you're playing Stetson. You're not getting away with that with a Pac-12 champion. No, sir, That's you're it. not. It's real simple. All right, so here's what we're going to do. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to run to our first break of the day. When we come back, we are going to take a look at some of the other games up and down the bracket this morning. We are going to take a look at some of the results 
from yesterday. We are going to take a look at some of the upsets. There were a couple. We're going to take a look at a couple of the upsets that I picked. Some I got very close. Some I nailed. Some I missed by like a lot, a lot. We're going to take a look at some of those. It's accountability buddy time. We're going to check in on our bracket competition and see who's up at the top in our bracket competition. It's a big, fat basketball day in America, my friends. My name is Rob Brown. My guy Brandon back in the network studio in charge of the buttons and the switches and the levers and the gears and the pulleys that keep us on the air. Ladies and gentlemen, happiest of Friday mornings. Let's get it. It's the Rob Brown Show on the Fan Upstate. Real sports talk, real sports fans. The fan upstate is the sports voice of you, the upstate fan. Call 844 Fan Phone. That's 844 326 3663. The fan upstate. Can you hear everything? Okay, I'm gonna go to the restroom real quick, okay? Upstate is your home for exclusive Westwood One coverage for the journey to the tournament. Uh, it's March Madness. Oh, this is absolute madness. madness. March Madness from Westwood One. Uh, so we're going to be popping on breaks a little bit more frequently than we do. But bear with us. Stay right there. We'll be back in 30 seconds. <laughs> Saturday, 25 Sunday, and only 40 for the entire weekend. Kids 12 and under are free. For more details, go to sccomiccon.com or find us on Facebook and Instagram. Your morning jolt of sports. It's the Rob Brown Show. You need the dabble that says, yeah, our fans should be furious. They should be furious with me. Instead, you got the dabble that's going, hey, winning's hard, man. It's tough to do. Not everybody can do it. Well, a lot of other teams are doing it, coach. The best is the standard. Well, it's not right now. You are, by definition, by your own phraseology, not meeting the standard. You need 2010 dabo back, not 2023 dabo, because 2023 dabo is prideful and comfortable. 2010 Dabo was trying to kick ass to prove he deserved to be there. The Clemson Tigers became a dynasty because Dabo was not prideful and comfortable. He was angsty and he had a point to prove. After a decade of having college football in a stranglehold, this dominance does not go out in a blaze of glory. It goes out with a... Yeah. But you need to take the wide orbit computer out of utility every time we go to break. And put okay. it back in utility every time we start a segment. Okay. So that's going to, we got to remember to do that every single segment. And for those of you that are watching at home, you get a little background radio. This is how the game really works. This is how the, how the magic gets made, man. Poor Brandon got like 19 things added onto his plate this morning because of this. <laughs> All right, we have 40 seconds. Fifteen seconds, sir. All right, come back. Brown show. Only on the fan. The, the fan. fan. Upstate. 
It is the Rob Brown Show. It is the Fan Upstate. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Ever so wonderful to have you with us on a, I hope, lovely Friday morning. We are taking a look at the first half of the first round of the NCAA Men's Basketball Tournament yesterday. And let's just start going through some of these games and some of these results. There are a few of them that we don't really need to spend a ton of time talking about. North Carolina blows the Wagner Seahawks out of the water. No one seed upset on day number one. 18 points uh, for a couple of Seahawks players, but it was not enough as you got 22 out of RJ Davis including four of seven from deep Armando Baycott throws down the double double 20 points 15 boards also had one assist one steal and one block in that game as well you got 16 off the bench for North Carolina uh, out of Jalen Withers yesterday just one of those games where uh, Wagner was outclassed. I mean, it's a, it's a 16-1 matchup. 99.99999% of the time, this is the type you expect there. The two-seed Arizona went up against Long Beach State. Listen, Arizona won this game uh, by 20. 85-65 was your final. Long Beach State made this interesting for about 33 minutes of the game. For about 33 minutes of the game. Uh, It was 35-41 at halftime. Early in the second half, Long Beach had themselves a little mini run that they put together. They made a pass at Arizona. But at the end of the day, Arizona is who Arizona is. Listen to this, though. And and, and this is why I've got Arizona moving into the Final Four. But I think I might have screwed up here. I might have, I might have, I might have. This is one of those I told you sometimes. You overthink your bracket. Sometimes you underthink your bracket. I think I might have underthought Arizona. I liked what Arizona did down the stretch. I like late season Arizona. They carried momentum into this tournament. I liked Arizona. Uh, The Arizona Wildcats, of their 85 points, all 85 came from the starters, uh, with the exception of eight. You had eight bench points. All eight bench points came from one cat. All eight bench points came from Jaden Bradley. Every other point, you had five Arizona starters scoring the double digits. 13, 11, 20, 15, and 18 for Johnson, Bayo, Boswell, Larson, and Love, respectively. Uh, Arizona does not have a lot of depth. And that came out yesterday because every time that Arizona went to the bench, which was not very frequently. Uh, They had two bench players that played double-digit minutes yesterday. Lewis played 13. Bradley played 23. Nobody else played more than eight minutes off the bench. But whenever Arizona would go to the bench, uh, Long Beach State would make a little baby run at him. Long Beach State would would, kind of knot the score up, close the score up just a little bit. So I am now a little bit concerned about the Arizona Wildcats out of the bottom of that bracket. They get the Dayton Flyers in round two uh, on Saturday. That is a matchup with a team in Dayton that was, y'all, I, I, I called Nevada to win that round, and I basically put that game on the back burner with about eight minutes left to play because Nevada had put Dayton away, except for they didn't. Except for they didn't. What did Dayton outscore Nevada like? like 20 to 20 to two run. Yeah. I mean, unbelievable Nevada that, that was so far Nevada had the choke job of the tournament through, through day one, Nevada to me had the choke job of the tournament with the exception of maybe the Kentucky Wildcats. who we're going to come to here in just a minute, but this Arizona team, I'm now a little afraid, honestly, like I'm a little afraid of this Dayton matchup all of a sudden. Arizona's got the superior talent across the starting five, just like they did in round one against Long Beach State. But the more you end up with teams like Dayton and then potentially a team like either Clemson, Baylor, New Mexico, uh, not, not as much worried about Colgate, but a team like the other three they could see in the round of 16, Clemson, Baylor, New Mexico, when they start running into teams that have a little bit more depth, 
have more Division I quality players coming off the bench than Long Beach State University does. I don't know that Arizona's got the depth to go with that. So I've got Arizona. Uh, I apologize. I've got them in the, uh, yeah, I've got them in my final four. I have them knocking off North Carolina to get to the final four. Listen, it's one game, and this is why we play tournaments and don't just hand them out on paper. The team that played for North Carolina yesterday can beat the team that played for Arizona yesterday. Uh, they just they just can't. Looking down some more of the opening round games from yesterday, Iowa State over South Dakota State. Your final in that one, 82-65. The Jackrabbits just don't have it to match up with Iowa State. This game was a seven-point difference at halftime. Iowa State outscored by 10 in the second half, and they did exactly what I thought they were going to do. They try to limit the possessions. That being said, South Dakota State didn't just didn't play poorly. 43.5% from the floor. They were 10 of 24 for 42% from out wide. But look, Iowa State shot almost 60% from the floor. They shot almost 50% from the arc. Uh, they, 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 they play good defense, good discipline defense. South Dakota State only had 11 free throws in this game. This is the Iowa State that I was talking about when we were doing our breakdowns earlier in the year. This is the Iowa State that I think makes it into uh, the Sweet 16. Now, I'm screwed because I had Drake. We're coming to them here in just a minute. I thought Drake was going to be a nice little Cinderella team for us this year, and Drake just absolutely crapped the bed yesterday. We're coming to them in a minute. Uh, look. Tennessee did exactly what I thought they were going to do against St. Peter's. I do not bet in college basketball and only very, 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 very deep breath. Very, very, very rarely am I going to bet uh, a, a, a odds on favorite to cover up a 20 point or more spread. I just don't do it. 20 part, 20 points is a lot of points to win by. Uh, even when you're talking top to bottom of the bracket, I took Tennessee to cover up 22 and a half points. That's one of the bets that I won yesterday. I took the volunteers to win that game by 22 and a half or better. And they did over St. Peter's one Peacock in double digits yesterday, one at nine. Nobody else had more than six. And then there's Tennessee Dalton connect 23 points, eight of 15 from the floor, four of eight from deep. Uh, Tennessee went to the stripe 25 times, knocked down 18 of them and out rebounded St. Peter's by like a lot to a little 47 rebounds for Tennessee, 21 for St. Peter's Tennessee, just the better team. Uh, it took Creighton a very long time to pull away from the Akron zips. They finally did win by 17, 77 to 60 is your final score. In that one, and once again, listen, there are things, there are narratives, there are stats, there are figures that you want to keep a lookout for when you get to March. One of them is three points. Uh, if you are a team, as we talked about with South Carolina and as happened, if you're a team that lives by the three in March, you become a team that dies by the three, right? If you're at BYU, same story. If you are a team that lives by the three, you are a team that dies by the three. It is very difficult to put together a team that runs uh, and 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 relies on lifting a bunch and making a bunch of three-pointers. It's hard to do in March when every team you come up against is getting progressively better and better. Um, Yesterday, 6 of 28 from the floor went the Akron Zips. They were shooting the lights out from behind the arc. The problem is the lights stayed on. They just weren't dropping, shooting about 21% from the floor last night. This was just a war of attrition. This was just Creighton allowing Akron to wear themselves out, and they did the Blue Jays on to round two. Uh, Illinois, 85-69 winners over Moorhead State. The Eagles made this one really juicy for a little while. Uh, this was a one-point game. At halftime, it was 39-38 at the half between Illinois, the Fighting Illini, and Moorhead State University. Moorhead got 27 and 23 out of two different players. They had uh, Riley Minix go 
for 27. He is kind of their leader. He showed it yesterday. They had Jordan Lathan go for 23 in this one. The problem you had for Moorhead State was there's no ballots. They didn't have anybody else that was able to really pitch in when it started to get dicey. Your other store, your other starters, Stetwell Thomas and Miles, scored eight, six, and two respectfully, and you had or respectively, pardon me, and you had three total points off the bench. This was another game that was just a war of attrition. This was another game that just, yeah, you, you just waited. You just waited till the talent level kicked in and showed up. A lot of respect for what the Moorhead State Eagles did yesterday, keeping right in the back pocket of Illinois, but ultimately enough was not enough. How about the 14-1 upset? The Oakland Golden Grizzlies last night, and here's my favorite part. Jack Golke for for uh, for Oakland is a name that you haven't heard this season. You know how I know you haven't heard Jack Golke's name this season? Because I haven't heard Jack Golke's name this season. And all Jack Golke did came yesterday in that game was shoot 10 of 20 from behind the arc. My man knocked down 10 three-pointers in this game. You can count on one hand, the list of players that had a 10 three-pointer game down the stretch. He ended up with 32 when it was all said and done, as he also had a couple of free throws. But 10 of 20, all he shot was three-pointers. He did not lift a shot that wasn't a three in this game, and he made Kentucky pay on the flip side. Uh, I, I Listen, I don't know what the hell's going on with John Calipari. 2021, no invitation to the tournament. 2022, an invitation bounced in the first round. 2023, an invitation bounced in the second round. And now 2024, an invitation bounced in the first round. From the last four years, Kentucky has one tournament W. So the, uh, the, the, the thought that I know a lot of big blue folks are having this morning is it's time to move on. It's time to try something different. John Cal's not the guy. Uh, my friends, you're in trouble. And you're in trouble because you have John Calipari locked in for like a $34 million buyout if you were ready to move on. And in basketball, that's a lot. In football, that might not be the end of the world. In basketball, that's a lot of money to throw at a coach to not be your coach anymore. A, and B, unless you are just willing to be experimental and recognize that sometimes when you go to the lab and you put together an experiment, sometimes that experiment blows up in your face. Who's to say it's not going to get worse? John Calipari is still bringing in elite-level talent to Kentucky. There's no doubt about it. But yesterday... I think big blue fans put this team uh, very much on the my or under the microscope. Yesterday, I think it's the first time we all looked at Kentucky and went, "Something's wrong here, y'all. Something's wrong. We got Houston. We have a sorry Lexington. We have a problem because this Kentucky team down three at halftime never really was able to get a sustained run." going against Oakland, and even when they tried to put one together, they fell apart defensively and were letting Oakland just do whatever the hell they wanted. Biggest surprise. Brandon, biggest, biggest surprise in, in round one, Kentucky getting bumped by Oakland? I think it is. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I You know, I just have, that's the one I messed up on. I had Kentucky winning, but when they started saying it on the TV that when uh, Kentucky's down by five, it's getting harder and harder for Kentucky. There's something going to happen wrong for them. And, you know, I was actually starting to cheer for the underdog. I'm like, you know, even though the uh, Golki said that they were not Cinderella's at the interview at the end of the game, I said they were. They were have to absolutely be Cinderella's. They did a fantastic job. They were not scared. They played with big boys. They played big boy ball. And you got to tip your cap to Oakland for what they did. Fun to watch. Fun to watch. Fun to watch. Fun to watch <clears throat> Golki go off for his 32. I, uh, I mean, they are. They absolutely are a Cinderella. I'll tell you who should 
have been the Cinderella today. I'll tell you who I was very close to getting onto this radio show and hitting a victory dance this morning. The Sanford Bulldogs. The Sanford Bulldogs. I thought Bucky Ball had Kansas yesterday. I called this. This was one of my first round upsets. And I thought. I swore it was on. I had nailed it. I thought that this was done. You ended up in a spot where with 16 seconds left. Kansas is going the length of the floor on the quick inbound. Back the other way comes Sanford on defense. An all ball run down block from behind against the Jayhawk breakaway. And it got called for, and I mean this, the weakest foul of this tournament. And when I say this tournament, I don't mean the weakest foul of this tournament so far. I mean the weakest foul of this tournament. It was all ball. And so in a situation where the Samford Bulldogs would have had the ball because there were three blue jerseys coming back to that basketball, no white ones around. In a situation, I'm not saying they would have won, still had to do something offensively. Uh, Samford would have had that ball with 14 seconds on the clock, down one, but instead, because the, the Jayhawk player lost his balance in that spot, it got wiped off the board, and Samford watched uh, Kansas shoot a couple of free throws and effectively put the game out of reach at that point. Um, I think yesterday, Brandon, I think the officiating was good across the tournament. Honestly, I think oh, yeah. the officiating was good across the tournament. There's not a game. There were a couple of games that may be a bad call here and there, but I thought by and large yesterday, the officiating was not something that those of us with loud mouths and microphones were going to wake up this morning ranting and raving about. That one call, however, changed the direction of the tournament because I do think there was a very good opportunity for Bucky's team to come down, score a deuce, and win this basketball game, and instead, Kansas got handed a Christmas present come early yesterday. I uh, so I'm going to tip my cap to the refs for everything that they did. Um, I, normally, you don't want to have that kind of situation happen in Sanford and Kansas, where the referees um, cause the result or the outcome of the game based off of a questionable call. Uh, I uh, also want to commend Bucky for not saying anything about the refereeing because you know that can be a substantial fine or it can even be your job kind of thing. So I want to commend him for not criticizing the refs. He said that we were in the position to win and we just didn't get it done in time. I uh, I commend Sanford for hanging with the big boy. Yes, it was Kansas. and Yes, they had uh, several big players out, but uh, we've seen it all season long. There's a reason why Sanford went perfect at home. Um, Bucky Ball is a legit uh, form of basketball that – no team is really prepared for, and uh, if Sanford continues on this path, I think for years to come, it's going to be Furman and Sanford each year going for the SoCon Championship. I uh, I enjoy this game tremendously. I think uh, a, a a huge nod to Sanford for what they did, and just just dis honestly disappointing that they didn't get that opportunity because that was one hundred percent an efficient chase down block uh no foul all ball should have been back in the hands of the bulldogs with a chance to win that game uh i do not feel bad about that pick i did pick Sanford to cover i did not bet them on the money line but those of you in the rob brown show bracket challenge you know i did have Sanford winning that game in the bracket as well let's run to a break when we come back here in just a minute we keep going down the scores from yesterday round one and the first half of round one in the record books we got to talk byu duquesne we got to talk nc state nailed it south uh, texas tech we got to talk nevada dayton colorado state lays an egg against texas drake had the Cougs beat and then fell apart. Michigan State, y'all told me, never bet against Izzo in March, and I screwed up and did it anyway. We're talking first round when we come back. Rob Brandon and you on the Rob Brown Show with the Fan Upstate. <laughs> All 
All right. Be right back. All righty. All right, guys. We'll step away for just a minute. We will be right back. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Mike. Some 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 of the brackets are real, real bad. Some of them are real bad. Some of them are real good. I don't think we had we didn't have any perfect bracket brackets in our competition. They said nationwide, there's only a thousand perfect uh, brackets left. Uh, there were. Uh, 89% of brackets had at least one loss. 89% had at least one loss after the first three games. That's crazy. Yep. 30 seconds. Ten seconds. Talk to Robin Lonzo. Call eight four four Fan Phone. That's eight four four F A N F O N E. This is the award winning Rob Brown Show. Mornings on the Fan Upstate. 
It is indeed the award-winning Rob Brown Show. In fact, the two-time South Carolina Broadcasters Association Sports Talk Radio Show of the Year. It's the Rob Brown Show right here on The Fan Upstate. Good morning, my friends. Great to have you as we are talking first-round tournament action. We have made it through a large chunk of the games. Let's keep going. A 5-12 upset that I picked. And I got very, very wrong. A 21-point win for the Gonzaga Bulldogs yesterday. Uh, Mark Few does it again. Knocks off the McNeese Cowboys 86-65. Uh, McNeese had a lot of momentum coming in <coughs> to this tournament. McNeese had Will Wade coming in to this tournament. Will Wade is one of the better college basketball coaches in action right now. Uh, as I as I talked about on the show yesterday, LSU did not want to get rid of Will Wade. Uh, LSU, I th- in fact, I think was doing everything they could not to get rid of Will Wade. But when the FBI gets involved in your program, it's hard not to move on from that guy. I really thought that Will Wade, with an extra handful of days to prepare uh, and the athletes he has on that McNeese State team, I really thought Will Wade was going to have this McNeese team ready to go. In fact, I had them carrying on to the Sweet 16. Instead, they get bounced by the Zags in round one, 86-65. And uh, this is one of those games that I don't really think you need to spend a ton of time and analysis on. At the end of the day, Gonzaga was just a better basketball team. I've told you guys a story in the past about my old middle school football coach, guy by the name of Tom Grant, and we played our rivals prior middle school one year. We got beat like 35 to three, and we walked back into the locker room. Uh, it was it was obviously quiet. We were all sitting around on the weight benches. We were all waiting for Tom Grant, who was a gruff ex-military guy, to walk in the room and light into us, and he walked in. And he took off his big oversized straw hat and he set it down on the ground next to him. And he sat down on a weight bench, which we never saw Tom Grant sit down. And he took a swig out of his Coca-Cola bottle and he looked up at us and he said, boys, today you guys had the biggest problem in sports. Sometimes the other team's just better than you are. And that's what this was. Gonzaga was just a better team than McNeese, uh, the McNeese Cowboys. They didn't really do anything wrong, but they didn't shoot the ball particularly well. 33 and a third percent from the floor, just five of 22 from deep, whereas Gonzaga shot over 50% from the floor, including 48% from the stripe. Gonzaga, just a better basketball team. That's all there is to this one. Uh, Brandon tried to talk me into taking the Duquesne Dukes <laughs> over BYU. He tried to talk me out of going with the Storm and Mormons. This is a team in BYU that throughout the course of the season, when they had success, they were shooting the three-point ball up north of 41, 42% yesterday, just 33 and a third percent. They were eight of 24, but they were also bad from the field. They shot 38.6% from the field. They ended up uh, with uh, 12 turnovers in this game. The Duquesne Dukes, on the other hand, very, very efficient with the basketball. They shot 46% from the floor. They shot 39% from deep. They did not force anything deep. They were willing to extend out possessions. It was more about having efficient offensive possessions than anything else for the Duquesne Dukes yesterday. Duquesne gets it done 71-67 over BYU moving on into the next round. And uh, just a, honestly, Brandon, just a disappointing day for BYU. Uh, everything I said that BYU can't do, they, they did. did. Everything I said BYU needs to do, they didn't. Duquesne just played efficient basketball. Sometimes that's enough. Well, Duquesne had something to prove. It had been since 1969 that they had won their last NCAA tournament game, which is a phenomenal amount of time. This sits over 20,000 days. They're the third longest uh, uh, difference between a school making uh, making the tournament and winning their first game in 
That to me, it's, it's astonishing to think that they hadn't won in over 20,000 days in the NCAA tournament. And they had a little chip on their shoulder. And, you know, like I told you, there was just something about uh, Duquesne. It's something to prove. And it is BYU. And they haven't shown me that it factor. And they still didn't show me the it factor. And um, Duquesne got it going. I do think that their run is going to end against Illinois. I feel Illinois is going to come back and uh, play some big boy basketball. And we're going to see Duquesne fall. But I want to give congratulations to the Dukes for getting your first win since 1969. All right, that's our, uh, one hour in the books already, ladies and gentlemen. Just like that, we reached the end, uh, the end of hour number one. When we come back here in hour number two, we got your water cooler cheat sheet, the top three sports stories that you need to know before you head to the office today. We will let you know coming up at 840. Brandon Fricky, the captain of the Greenville Triumph, is set to join us to talk a little Triumph footy with us. And at 9 o'clock, scheduled we will find out if they make it or not i know it's very early for those evening dudes to get out of bed but scheduled to be joined by the two hosts of the newest sports talk radio show to air right here on the fan up state starting on monday it's wire to wire with diesel and cole bryson diesel and cole will join us at nine o'clock we'll talk some basketball we'll talk some football with diesel and cole at nine so stick around don't go anywhere. We're going to have some fun this morning on the Rob Brown Show in the Fan Off State. Now, it's time for a sports flash. It is one and done for the South Carolina Gamecocks as they fall to the Oregon Ducks yesterday. 87-73 is your final. Why? Jermaine Cousinard. A former South Carolina Gamecock who transferred to Oregon after the firing of Frank Martin, who went 14 of 22 from the field, 5 of 9 from deep, and dumped 40 points against the Lamont Paris-led squad. Michi Johnson led all Gamecocks with 24. He had 13 from B.J. Mack and 15 from Taylon Cooper. Not another Gamecock in double figures, unfortunately. However, the U.S. men's national team knocked off to make a 3-1 in a CONCACAF Nations League game last night, but they waited until the dying minutes to make it exciting. The U.S. gave up a shocking goal 30 seconds into the match, but Haji Wright scored twice in extra time after Jamaica scored an own goal in stoppage time to send it to that extra time. 3-1, the walk-off for the U.S. men's national team. We'll break that game down and more in the next hour of the Rob Brown Show and the Fan Up State. Now, CBS. All right. All right, dudes, we're going to step away for just a couple of minutes. Please stay right there. We'll return briefly. Don't go. <laughs>
and gentlemen, we are back. Thank you guys for hanging out with us. One minute. The Fan Upstate WYRD Greenville WORD Spartanburg WFBC HD3 Greenville W249DL Greenville W246CV Spartanburg CBS Sports Radio Always live on the Free Odyssey app and check this out. You're on official Rob Brown Lockdown. Represents being real. Yeah. Real unfiltered sports talk. Manufactured locally for the Carolinas. Lockdown. This is the Rob Brown Show. Get Rob. Only on the fan upstate. And here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Hour number two of the Rob Brown radio program underway. This is is the fan upstate welcome in great to have you all my name is rob brown brandon filling in for the great one lonzo today lonzo on vacation he will make his triumphant return with trumpets blaring and banners unfurled on monday but very glad to have brandon in with us all week long doing an excellent job uh we have obviously talked quite a bit about the first half of the first round of the NCAA tournament coming on later today. We'll spend some time talking about the back half of the first round of the NCAA tournament, including Clemson. One of, actually, I shouldn't even say one of, the most bet against favorite in round number one of this tournament. America lined up against Clemson, at least when it comes to putting money on the books can they overcome that we're going to talk about that match coming up later on in the show at 8 40 this morning we'll be joined by brandon fricky he is the captain of the greenville triumph the triumph getting a win on the road at sc united the bantams this past wednesday evening in round one of the lamar hunt u.s open cup we'll talk to him about that as well as This Saturday's matchup against Ford Madison back at home in Paladin Stadium. So that is coming up very, very shortly at 840. Brandon Fricky will join us. And then in the final hour of the show, we will be joined by the new host of our new show, which starts on Monday. It's called Wire to Wire with Cole Bryson and Diesel 
Cole and Diesel will join us here on the show. We'll talk to them a little bit about what they see that show being, how that show is going to be structured. We'll give you guys the introductory run through of our new show, Wire to Wire, which starts on Monday from 3 to 7 right here and only on the Fan of State. Make sure you stick around for that. All of that coming up later on in the show. Coming up right now on the show, however, ladies and gentlemen, it is 7.05 in the morning. It is just about time for you to finish getting dressed, to grab that big old cup of coffee, to hop in the rig, to drive to work, to get settled in, to respond to those emails, to get your day of pretending to be productive underway. And by that, I mean to get your day of watching basketball while you're at work and doing your best to make sure the boss doesn't catch you underway. But at some point during that day of pretend productivity, at some point during the day where you are staring down the hallway trying to make sure that your boss doesn't catch you watching basketball instead of, you know, doing your job, well, at some point, you're going to take a smoke break, a water break, whatever kind of break it is that you might take. And when you do take that break, you're going to want to talk about sports. And if you're going to want to talk about sports, you're going to want to talk about these three stories in the water cooler cheat sheet. Are you ready for the playbook of the peculiar? The almanac of the absurd? And the encyclopedia of the extraordinary? Well, you better be. Because we're diving headfirst into the three top stories that will have your co-worker saying... You hear that? Even before they take their first bathroom break... Uh, <laughs> no. Here we go. Welcome to the water cooler cheat sheet on the fan upstate. It is the Water Cooler Cheat Sheet, the top three sports stories that you need to know before you get to work and start talking sports with your coworkers this morning. When you do, this is what they'll be discussing. It is your Water Cooler Cheat Sheet. Let us begin with item number one. The CONCACAF Nations League currently underway, which features teams from across North, Central, and Latin America. And the U.S. entered this tournament projected to be favorites. Yesterday evening, they went up against a game Jamaica team, the Reggae Boys. And this was a team that's banged up. This is not the best version of the Jamaican national team, which makes this story as a fan, if we're being honest, a little bit troubling to me. But a win's a win. The Americans knock off Jamaica 3-1 in the CONCACAF Nations League game last night. They waited until the dying minutes to make it excited. The U.S. gave up a shocking goal just 30 seconds into the match. It was the quickest goal scored against the Americans so far this century. And then it stayed. That 1-0 scoreline in favor of Jamaica for like a very, very long time. We got to stoppage time in this game. It was 95 minutes later when the Jamaicans scored an own goal. A reserve came on, made the unfortunate mistake, headed a ball past his own goalkeeper into the back of the net, and it gave the Americans life in a game that, frankly, they probably did not deserve to win. The own goal set the game into extra time. And then shortly into extra time, Haji Wright, who was not expected to even be in this game. Haji Wright thought that he was going to be getting some time off during this round, uh, this round of matches in the Nations Cup. He did instead get called up. Greg Berhalter went with a heavy attacking lineup late in this game that included Gia Reno and Haji Wright. Those two connected to give the Americans a 2-1 lead. Just a few minutes later, they would do it again. Haji Wright netting both goals. Gia Reno on the assist both times. That ended with a 3-1 scoreline when it was all said and done. I... um. I hate to say this. I don't want to say this. I have to say it. 
absolutely zero faith in Greg Berhalter. Absolutely none. Uh, I, I, there was exactly and precisely no reason that this team needed to be in desperation mode. Last night, you were going up against far from the best team that the Jamaicans could field, and you still needed a miracle. Again, if Jamaica doesn't net an own goal, the Americans lose this game. And frankly, the Americans deserved to lose this game. They were flat. They were uninspired. After Jamaica scored the opening goal, there was no sense to me of urgency out of this team. I didn't see a team that looked at a 1-0 scoreline and said, all right, let's go out there and just overwhelm this team. Let's just go be athletes. And listen, I've said for years, one of the problems that I used to have with American football is I thought we relied too much on the spray and play uh, spray and pray method. I thought we relied too much on we're going to kick it towards your goal and then we're just going to see if we can outrun you and out athlete you down there. Uh they tried it last night. They went back to the well and it did not work. This team has got to be better. The Paris Olympics are right down the road. Uh we don't need to qualify for the World Cup but we should be playing like we care. And we just don't. And I I, 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 I know it feels like a lazy take. And I, I think to some degree, it might very well be a lazy take. It feels like a lazy take, but I cannot help but continue to think that this falls at the feet of Greg Berhalter. There was precisely and exactly zero reasons that this team's not out for blood last night and instead they had to have the Jamaicans stab themselves in the heart to get it with the own goal but a win's a win onward and upward for the U.S. men's national team a 3-1 win over Jamaica last night in the CONCACAF Nations League item numero dos it is one and done for the Gamecocks of South Carolina as they get knocked off by the Oregon Ducks last night 87-73 is your final and there were two main reasons why one of them goes by the name of Mfale Dante Dante is a guy who goes seven foot he is a brick wall that wears a uniform the kid's a stud a lot of folks saying wait a minute Rob how can and 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 this is this is a take I've heard a number of times and it's a take that I I I I I don't know how else to say it. Unless you're watching college basketball, I expect this take, right? If you don't watch college shooty hoops, I expect this take. Dante missed a lot of time. Dante is a game-changing player. And Fale Dante is a player whose mere presence on the floor alone changes the context of a basketball game. I saw a lot of people saying, uh, this is an Oregon team. That had to steal a win in the Pac-12 championship game just to make the tournament. And that is true. That is correct. But I'm going to go ahead and say, number one, they won that Pac-12 tournament game not because they got lucky. Not because they got hot. They won that game because they finally had their full complement of players. And they finally had Undali, uh, uh, they finally had Dante excuse me, to facilitate to run the offense through and he did it yesterday 23 points 7 of 9 from the field 9 of 15 from the stripe as the Gamecocks went a little hacky shack on Infale Dante this is the Oregon Duck team that we had all year if anything if anything if Dante is playing in the regular season not only does Oregon have more than 23 wins at the conclusion of the Pac-12 tournament But honestly, I think they probably would have been one of the favorites going into that tournament. I don't think they would have been dropped back. This is a team with Dante playing that is probably more like a five seed than an 11 seed. This was, and I said it when the bracket dropped, this was a nightmare matchup for the Gamecocks. This was the worst of the draw. I would have rather gotten New Mexico as an 11 seed in the opening round here. I would have rather, honestly, I think I would have rather gotten probably any of the other 11 seeds 
that would have been a possibility in this spot. I I I, I think you got a bad draw. I would have rathered NC State than Oregon, as well as DJ and DJ are playing. I would have rather Duquesne than this Oregon team. And I'm not, I don't think, trying to make excuses for South Carolina, though it will sound that way. You played a damn good Oregon Ducks team that was not full strength for the majority of the season and got healthy and hot at exactly the right time. The other point score for Oregon Ducks uh, was Jermaine Cousinard, the former Gamecock. This was, as we talked about back at the beginning of the last hour, this was a narrative game. Why do we love March Madness? We love it for the stories. We love it for the upsets. We love it for the drama. We love it for the John Calipari's. We love it for the Kansas Samfords. We love it for the drama. And there was plenty of it here. Cousinard left Columbia after Frank Martin was let go, found his way to Oregon, and got a crack at his old team. Now, I don't necessarily think that Jermaine Cousinard has any animosity towards South Carolina. He certainly hasn't allowed it to be known if he does, but he damn sure played like he does. 40 points last night on 14 of 22 from the floor, 5 of 9 from deep, and he knocked down all 7 from the charity stripe. The Ducks, 87-73 winners. The Gamecocks bounced in round number one. Now, a couple of other things going on uh, for South Carolina. That is, of course, the women's basketball team. They have the number one overall seed in the women's tournament this afternoon. They will get their day started when they take on the Presbyterian Blue Hose. We're going to break that game down and that bracket down later on in the show. We will break down Don Staley's path uh, to the national championship a little bit later on in the show. They are betting favorites to win the tournament. If you're not a gambler, I, I can't begin to explain to you how absolutely ludicrous it is that a team is a minus money favorite to win a 64-team tournament. And of course, obviously, Clemson basketball, they come up later on today uh, over on the men's side. Clemson has a matchup this afternoon against New Mexico in the in another 6-11 game. Remember, we've talked about this. Those 6-11 games, they have been very friendly to the 11 seed over the years. Clemson and New Mexico at 3-10 this afternoon on True TV. Let's go to item number three. I don't know if you guys find this story as compelling as I do. But I do. Uh, yesterday evening, I got a chance, as I do every Thursday, to go visit my friends Trista and Nick on Bet MGM tonight. And some of you that are out driving around during that time period, around 11.20 on Thursdays, you may hear me make my weekly appearance on that show. It's one of my favorite things uh, to do. We talked like four minutes of college basketball, and then we talked about the Shohei Otani story. And why wouldn't we, right? So you, 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 we got all the developments out of the way yesterday. We found out that $4.5 million were paid out of Shohei Otani's bank accounts through wire transfers to an illegal gambling outfit. Then we learned that Shohei Otani's interpreter had been fired and he came out and said, oh, Shohei knew about it. Shohei knew about it. Shohei did it. Shohei actually pulled the trigger on the wire transfers because he didn't trust me with the money. Shohei, 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 Shohei. And then hours later, wouldn't you know it? But Shohei Otani's tra uh, tra uh, interpreter, translator, whatever you want to call him, is fired and the story changes. Now the story is that Shohei Otani did not know about this money, did not know about these wires, did not know about these payments, that they were all made without Shohei Otani's involvement at all. And late last night, the news dropped that Shohei Otani's representatives are officially 
asking law enforcement to look into the theft of the $4.5 million that were transferred via wire transfer to an illegal betting outfit. Is anybody else uh is anybody else getting conspiracy vibes out of this? Is anybody else getting there's more to the story vibes out of this? Is anybody else looking at this and wondering? And this is what I said last night on BetMGM tonight. I'm going to say it again here on this show. How has Rob Manfred not launched a whole ass investigation into this already? If this was not Shohei Otani, a man who is worth quite literally a billion plus dollars to Major League Baseball based on his popularity at home and abroad back in his, uh, his native country of Japan, across the other Asian countries. If this was, I don't know, Austin Riley, Gavin Lux, uh, Andrew McCutcheon, if this was anybody else, just you can even pick a good player, but just anybody else besides the billion-dollar man, does Rob Manfred not already have an investigation going, right? Does he not already? Now, he's going to come out. I'm going to go ahead and say this. He's going to come out probably today because people are calling for a response here. He's going to come out today, and what he's going to say is, we fully intend to investigate this, but we're going to let the legal process play out. We're going to let law enforcement do their job. We don't want to get involved and distract from law enforcement doing their job. We want to make sure that they have every opportunity to get to the bottom of this. And once they do, we will start our investigation based on those results. That's what he's going to say. He would launch a full-scale investigation if it was anybody else. I am getting the vibe. I asked if anybody else was. Brandon is raising his hand. I am getting the vibe that we are going to hear something insane coming out. We're not being told what's really going on. There's something that happened. And, I mean, there's no way Otani didn't really know about this. That, I mean, you know, and you even said this yesterday. Does uh, this guy have to be the – is he the fallback guy that Otani really is the gambling person? There's something that we're, that we're not being told. You know, we're being told half truth and whole lies. I agree entirely. Now, here's what I'm going to say. I don't care if Shohei Otani's gambling. I don't. I don't care if he's gambling. The problem is he's going to be gambling illegally and going through an illegal bookie is a good way to get yourself in trouble. I don't care if he is gambling. What I do care about is if he's gambling on baseball, first and foremost. And what I do care about is if Shohei Otani, it's going to turn out, is going to be Russell Wilson of baseball. He's going to be one of these guys who has such a manufactured image that he becomes unlikable. We'll see. I'll get some more details on this. We'll give them to you later, but that's your water cooler cheat sheet, the top three sports stories you need to know. We need to step away for just a minute. When we come back, let's look at this South Carolina, Oregon loss. Let's look at this New Mexico Clemson game up today at 3 10 PM. Let's talk shooty hoops we'll continue our basketball conversation when we come back brandon back in the network studio live from the casa de love i am rob brown you're listening to the rob brown show you're listening to the fan upstate your one-stop shop for all right guys be right back stay right there
ladies and gentlemen, we're back. Thanks for hanging in there. Rom's levels are so low. I have my volume all the way up. I can barely hear. Yeah, that's. Uh, you can bring up the, uh, the 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 Streamyard pot a little bit. Just make sure it's not over modulating me. Or I can turn up my. Actually, you know what I can do. Hang on, I can't see around my camera. Audio. Let's turn the mic volume. All right, I've turned the mic volume up. Does that make any difference at all? Yeah, you're better. When you're on, I do have you up higher just because it is so low. Yeah. But um, when he was saying that, that I was real loud, it's because I was adjusting myself. But I had I lowered my mic volume down just a little bit. Okay. Fifteen seconds. So is your final four still intact on day one? Yes, it is, Zach. My final four is still good to go. Fortunately, I've not lost any final four teams yet. I know a lot of people did yesterday. A lot of Kentucky brackets out there. I've lost three Sweet 16 teams. But no final four teams. I think as long as your final four stays alive until the Elite Eight, you got a chance. We're back. All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. The Rob Brown Show on your radio. It is the Fan Upstate. Rob Brandon filling in for the great one, Lonzo, uh, today. Broadcasting live from the Bro Cave at the Casa de Love. Some circumstances at the station requiring your boy to be at the house today. So if you join us on our live stream at facebook.com slash the fan upstate, twitter.com slash the fan upstate by searching and subscribing to the Rob Brown show on YouTube and Twitch. Uh, you get to come behind the scenes. You get to see my dear friends where it is that Rob Brown has been cooped up for like the last, I don't know, 24 hours, just working and watching basketball. It's spectacular. If we're being honest with each other, come check us out. Come hang out on the stream. We would love to have you join us here on the stream and here on the show. 97.7 FM, Greenville, 97.1 FM, Spartanburg, all around the world on the Odyssey app, A-U-D-A-C-Y. Grab it, put it on all your digital devices. And don't forget that you can ask your smart speaker of choice to play 97.1 the fan of state wherever you are whatever you're doing grab yourself a smart speaker and ask said smart speaker to play 97 one the fan of state she'll tune in immediately for you and you can listen wherever it is that you might be zach jumped in and said uh hey are your final four teams still intact here is the Good news, bad news, as I look at the Rob Brown Show Bracket Challenge. The bad news for your boy is I had Drake in the Sweet 16. They have been bounced. I had uh, Colorado State in the, uh, excuse me, I had uh, South Carolina in the Sweet 16 in my bracket. They have been bounced. I had McNeese in the Sweet 16 in my bracket. They have been bounced. So I am down three Sweet 16 teams so far. The good news is I have lost only, I believe, one Elite Eight. No, I've lost two Elite Eight teams. Uh, I have lost, no, I have not. I have lost uh, from the Elite Eight. I have lost actually no teams so far. My whole Elite Eight is intact still. Tennessee, Purdue, North Carolina, Arizona, uh, Auburn, Illinois, Duke, and Marquette. Now, half of them haven't played yet. But my entire Elite Eight is still in consideration right now. As far as the Rob Brown Show Bracket Challenge goes, as it stands right now, through the first half of the first day, we have got uh, April, Harper, Mike, Tournament Tiger. Uh, Tournament Tiger. I see what you did there. And I respect it. I don't like it. It's tournament. I don't respect it. It's tournament. Uh, but I but I do respect it. I do. Yeah, it's a good joke. Brandon and Kelly and John are all 13 games won 
through the first half of round one. Martin, Josh, Jimmy, Zachary, Joey, Zach, Ashley, Brian, Chris, and Jeremy, Alexander, Andrew, Carter, and those are your 12 wins so far. Uh, by the way, and just so you guys know, did have a bit of an issue uh, in that I did not delete last year's bracket challenge. I did not delete last year's bracket. So a lot of folks, unfortunately, uh, did not get the new invite. They just thought the old invite was good. So our last year's bracket competition did roll over. So what I'm going to have to do is I am going to, at the end of this whole thing, uh, at the end of this whole thing, I am going to have to basically combine the two brackets. I'm going to have to combine the two brackets and pull the scores over from both sides. So if you uh, if you look at the bracket competition and you look at uh, and you wonder why in the world do I have you know 12 games, but Rob's reading all these names above me that aren't on there. Uh, that's why, because there is a there are two different bracket pools that will be combined at the end. In the 11 win section right now, we've got Chief uh, Brandon right there in the producer's chair. Brandon is at 11 wins. Brooke Wesley, Brian, Jeremy Keegan, P1 Keegan, the 11 win bracket. Scott, Rich, Stephen, Sohel, Ty, Tracy, Andrew, Andrew, Jeffrey, Sean, Zachary, and Jim are all sitting on 11 wins and all very much in the competition right now. Over in our other bracket, our clubhouse leader across both bracket pools. And again, I will, uh, I will share our final results as we move on throughout the course of the tournament itself. There are two pools. A lot of folks in the old one that did not make it over to the other one. So, Tracy, currently sitting on 14 wins, is your clubhouse leader. After day one, he has more wins than everybody else. 13 wins. We got Carter Vickers from the drive. Steven Webb, a P1 in the stream right now. He's got 13. Tim Frisbee, former South Carolina Gamecock, is on 13 on that side as well. In the 12-win region, Dan, Brandon Chandler, Ashley, Allen, Carlos with a K from New York City involved. He's on 12 wins. Jeremy, Skrilla, Chris, John, all with 11 wins. 10 wins for John, Rodney, Joey B, Trey, um... I, I, here, here's here's how I know these brackets uh, can get a little squirrely the deeper we go into the tournament, right? Because your boy Rob Brown ended yesterday with seven wins. I am at the bottom of both pools right now, okay? But some of my speculative picks are what cost me on day one. My heavy hitters are still alive. My national champions are still alive. My entire Final Four is still alive. My entire Elite Eight is still alive. So I'm in a good spot here, even though I am digging up from the back end. Uh, I am currently, and I'm going to say this right now, and I'm going to be very, very upset about this, uh, though she is going to celebrate for just a minute and then be disappointed. I am currently, as of right this moment, Three games back of my own fiance at this point. All right? She got 10 wins on day one. I got seven, three games back. The problem is she made an old school mistake. She went home cooking. She went with the Gamecocks all the way to the natty out of that side of the bracket. She went home cooking, which means there is no way in Hades that she is going to be ahead of me at the end of this thing. But she is ahead of me right now. So uh, have a safe ride to work, sweetheart. Congratulations on winning one day. All right? You got me. You got me for a day. I'm proud of you. So that's where the brackets stand up right now. You can go check them out on the CBS Sports website. Uh, let's see. That is uh, that is one over on the other bracket. Uh, where do I stand in that one? In that one, yeah. In that one, I am uh, also way towards the bottom of the mix. By the way, to the... At least two people 
who named their brackets Robert Brown. I respect you. I do. I respect you. Thanks for making it weird and confusing for everybody, you trolls. I like it. All right. Let's run to a break. When we come back here in just a minute, let's talk Clemson. Let's talk New Mexico. Many of you Tiger Paw clad fans may not be super familiar with the logo, uh, the Lobos. Maybe you have not spent a lot of time watching the Lobos. Maybe you've not even seen a New Mexico game, even though you've known their your opponent for about a week now. Don't worry. I have. I'll tell you all about them, and we will break that game down when we come back. Clemson, New Mexico at 310. I'll give you everything you need to know about it when we return. Rob and Brandon with you. The Rob Brown Show rolls on. It is the Fan Upstate. Listen on demand. Have today's show sent straight to your phone. Text Fan Brown to 71307 or listen on demand at thefanupstate.com. This is the Rob Brown Show on the Fan Upstate. All right, guys, give me 30 seconds. We will be right back. I will tell you who when we come back. you guys hanging in there sorry i gotta go on break so many times working from the casa de love is a little different than working in the studio got a couple of things i gotta make sure my settings are good and all that during the breaks this is all 40 seconds if you check me out on bet for the cycle from saturday from noon to four on the betql network on twitch and on youtube or go to the odyssey app and search and subscribe to betql you can find our stuff there as well this is where i broadcast that show from Got the custom jersey layout back here. That goes Greenville Drive, uh, Carolina Gamecocks Hockey, and then uh, an old team that I used to support. Ten seconds. Text us at 71307. Keyword fan. This is the Rob Brown Show with Lonzo. Mornings on the fan. Upstate. The Rob Brown Show is back on your radio. It is the fan upstate. Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen. Rob Brown and Brandon filling in for Lonzo today. Glad to have him along for the ride. Uh, An hour from now. We will be joined by the captain of the Greenville Triumph, Brandon Fricky, will be on the air with us. Looking forward to chatting with him. 
if the phone lines cooperate. Uh, we have got Clemson and New Mexico coming up today. This is very interesting. Clemson, the most bet against seeding favorite in the first round of the tournament. America is backing the Lobos right now. So let's talk a little bit about some of the facts and figures. Then we'll get into the X's and the O's of this basketball competition. New Mexico has covered 23 times in 34 games with a spread this season. If they cover in this game, it'll be interesting. They are two and a half point favorites. Does not guarantee a win if they cover the spread, but 23 out of 34 is big. Clemson, 17 and 15 against the spread. So they're clipping the spread at just a touch over half the time. If they cover the spread in this game, uh, that's a win outright for Clemson uh, as they are plus two and a half. Clemson does cover the spread when they are two and a half point underdogs or more. 83.3% of the time, New Mexico covers as a favorite of two and a half or more 72% of the time in home games. The Lobos sport a better record against the spread compared to their ATS record in road games. Against the spread on the road, they are five and six. Against the spread, the Tigers have better results away than they do at home. They were eight and four against the spread in road games, eight and eight at home. This game should theoretically, we'll see how you Clemson fans turn out. This game should have a slight orange tint to it. This game is right up the road in Charlotte, New Mexico on the other side of the country. I would like to think that game, that uh, Clemson Tiger fans are going to show up in Charlotte to rep the boys. New Mexico outscoring opponents by 11 points per game. Uh, with a 392 to the positive side scoring differential. They put up 81 points per game. That is 20th in college basketball, but they give up 70 and a half game points per game. That is the 129th ranked defense in basketball. A name to know, Jalen House leads New Mexico, averaging 16 points per game, the 186th highest ranked in college basketball. Clemson, plus 195 in scoring differential, topping opponents by six points per game, averaging 77 per game, 76 in basketball, giving up 71 per game. That is 158th in basketball. What does that number mean? Not a lot. You will keep in mind that a part of the reason that Clemson is in this position is because of the schedule that they played. Brad Brownell put together one of the best schedules out of conference specifically, and then the benefit of playing in an ACC that I think was underappreciated this year, that differential does not mean as much. I'm going to give you the two names. I already mentioned one of them in Jalen House. The other name that Clemson fans need to be dialed in on today, aside from Jalen House, is JT Toppin. JT Toppin is a rebound machine. Guy's averaging just a touch shy of 10 rebounds a game, and a good chunk of those are, <coughs> pardon me, offensive rebounds. Clemson has got to make sure that JT Toppin is not wiping the offensive glass. If he is, you're going to be in a world of hurt. New Mexico, in terms of league efficiency, they are 68th in college basketball, averaging 99.8 points per 100 possessions and allowing 86 points per 100 possessions. That is the 19th ranked defense in terms of efficiency uh, in all of college basketball. The Tigers rank 32nd in college basketball in offensive efficiency averaging 102.6 points per 100 possessions. Here is where the game gets won or lost. Uh, Clemson ranks 233rd in defensive efficiency. They allowed 94.5 points per 100 possessions. But again, keep in mind, Clemson played a very impressive schedule. 
a very difficult schedule, a schedule that has to be respected, but a schedule that obviously uh, is going to lead to a little bit less impressive numbers when it comes to the averages across the season. Clemson opened as a one and a half point underdog. It moved to a two and a half dog with the early action coming out on the Lobos. Now that has slowed down just a little bit. It slowed down for once it jumped the full point. Vegas has not moved that number again since then. So what are we looking for? Uh, I am going to say first and foremost, this game is likely going to see a lot of points. The over-under line looked at 149 on the open. It has jumped all the way to 152 at this point, all right? Uh, if you're gambling this game, I don't suggest that you touch that number because I think it's going to land right in that neighborhood. I would have taken it at 149. I don't like it at 152. A lot of that is going to go with P.J. Hall. Averaging 19 points per game, has scored 18 or more in four straight contests, has scored 18 or more in 11 of his last 17. I think P.J. Hall is set up for a big day today because New Mexico's strength is not under the glass. New Mexico's strength is not going to be uh, playing inside-out basketball even on the defensive end of the floor. New Mexico's strength is going to be from the guards and the forwards. P.J. Hall should have a very good day. New Mexico is giving up a 49% success rate on two-point attempts. They are ranked 304th in college basketball on, per, uh, on, on points per play on shots at the rim. Shots inside of five feet, New Mexico is 304th in defense, defensive efficiency against them, which means this has got to be a, a P.J. Hall day. This is not a game. Let me repeat. This is not a game where you can see P.J. Hall get his first rebound 33 minutes into the game like he did against Boston College. This is a P.J. Hall game. And I know it doesn't sound like a lot. You're probably going to hit me with the, yeah, duh, Rob, obviously button. When I tell you that the game runs through an All-American caliber player like P.J. Hall. But it is especially true in this game. It is especially true in this game because that is the spot that New Mexico is at their weakest. It is interior play. It is defense around the basket that they struggle with. It is offense around the basket that they struggle with. The spot that they make it up is on the glass. The spot that they make it up is rebounding. P.J. Hall needs to make sure that they are not allowing New Mexico to own the boards, and P.J. Hall needs to dominate in the paint offensively if they do that they're going to be good i'm going to tell you what new mexico i think is going to try to do defensively i think they are going to try to take the three pointer away from clemson you are going to have to spring joe gerard the third i need to be involved again it is still a pj hall game but i need joe gerard the third to be involved in this game i need him knocking down some shots I think that New Mexico is probably going to have their toes on the three-point line playing defense out around the three and basically saying, hey, look, if P.J. Hall is P.J. Hall, that's fine. Nobody else is going to be, right? To me, that's a spot where I need P.J. Hall to I, I need P.J. Hall to score in the 30s today. I need him in the 30s. I'd love for him to threaten a 40-point game, but I need him in the 30s because they are going to try to take that three away. We will see. The Lobos have been pushed around by every average or better-than-average big man they have played against so far this year. They have given up 20 points to SDSU's Jaden Ledee. They gave up 20-plus uh, to Utah State's Great Osborne. They gave up 20 points to Air Force's Bo Becker, to Boise State's Omar Stanley. None of these guys are P.J. Hall, yet all of them scored 20. 
That's why I said you're going to have to work to open up the three. And if the three's not there, P.J. Hall will be. New Mexico is going to have to pick where they want to focus their defense. I think it's on the three point. Don't let, because if Gerard gets hot, if the shooters get hot on the outside, then all of a sudden PJ Hall's life gets even easier down low. Um, I'm all over this. I have seen PJ Hall's number at 17 and a half. I have seen it as high as 20 and a half. I don't care. I'm taking the over. Uh, that is the reason why. Despite the fact that they are money line dogs, despite the fact that they are two and a half point underdogs. And maybe I'm falling for it here. Maybe I'm falling for it. Maybe I'm letting the optimism get the better of me. I like Clemson to outright win this game today. I like it. This is not me blowing smoke. This is not me kissing butt. This is nothing more than a genuine take. The softest spot of the Lobos, the interior, is where Clemson should be at their strongest with P.J. Hall. I expect this game to be a slowed down game compared to what we've seen a lot of out of Clemson games in the ACC. I think Clemson wants to keep this from becoming a track meet. I think they want to keep this an absolute fist fight in the paint. I think they want to keep this a game that it is P.J. Hall versus the world. And I'm going to go ahead and bet that is the case. Give me P.J. Hall in his over point total and give me Clemson as a money line outright winner in this game. That's two hours in the books. It's halftime. The dancing girls in the marching band said to come out quick. Grab a Gatorade and an orange slice because when we come back in hour three, we get away from basketball. We got to get into this Otani story. We got to get into some baseball. We are now less than a week away until opening day. We got to get some NFL football. Brandon Fricky, captain of the Greenville Triumph, joins us in less than an hour. Diesel and Cole Bryson join us at nine. Let's get it. The Rob Brown Show continues after the Sports Flash. It is one and done for the South Carolina Gamecocks men's basketball team. They fall to the number 11 Oregon Ducks yesterday, 87-73. Former Gamecock turned Duck Jermaine Cousinard became just the fourth Pac-12 player in history with a 40-point game in the tournament. Michi Johnson led all Gamecocks with 24. Taylon Cooper had 15. B.J. Mack had 13. The Gamecocks shot over 44% from the floor and 46% from feet, but were out-rebounded and had dramatically more turnovers than the Oregon Ducks in the loss. The U.S. men's national team knocked off Jamaica 3-1 in a CONCACAF Nations League game last night, but they waited until the dying minutes to make it exciting. The U.S. gave up a shocking goal just 30 seconds into the match and played from behind for most of it. 95 minutes later, five minutes into a six-minute stoppage period, Jamaica scored its own goal to level it at 1-1 and send it to extra time. Haji Wright then scored out once but twice, both off of Gio Reyna assist. And the Shoei Otani story grew me interesting yesterday. After the announcement that Otani's interpreter was fired, representatives requested police look into allegations of massive theft related to the $4.5 million paid to an illegal gambling outfit. We'll give you more details on that story when we come back. The Rob Brown Show continues on the Fan Up State. Now, CBS. You guys want to see my dog? Oh, hang on. <laughs> a wire over here there's the there's the brocade bar and there's there's the remy dog and my dirty laundry please ignore that that's the dog remy dog what are you doing are you a good girl are you do you wanna there's my dog See, this is this is why we broadcast from home you get uh intimate looks into the reflections of the life of one rob brown uh <laughs> all right you guys, I'm going to take a one-minute break. When I come back, I will answer all the questions in the chat. So please.
right, thanks for hanging in there, guys. Let's go back and answer some of these questions, shall we? Uh, what is your final four then, Rob, and who is your national champion? I'm not going to lie. I went against the chalk in this one. My final four from the left side of the bracket, I've got the four seed Auburn taking on the two seed Arizona. Over on the right side of the bracket, I've got the four seed Duke taking on the one seed Purdue. I've got Duke beating Purdue. I don't think Purdue is as good as everybody's made him out to be. And if there is a team out there that is going to negate Zach Eady getting calls, it's the Duke Blue Devils, right? If you are concerned about the officials playing a role in a game, Duke's the team you bet on. So I've got Auburn knocking off Arizona. I've got Duke beating Purdue. And I'm taking the Auburn Tigers as my national champions uh, this year. Uh, got a couple of you guys that asked if uh, JT Toppin is related to Obi Toppin. Uh, the, um, they are. Yes, that is Obi Toppin's brother. That is uh, correct. Let's see. How many D1 NCAA basketball teams are there? There are 351, uh, 351 eligible D1 college basketball programs. 351 is your answer on that one. That's a healthy number. That's why a lot of people want to expand the tournament. They're going, all right, 351. How can we, how can we not uh, add, right? How can, we, how can we not throw more up there? Let's see. What else we got in the chat? Uh, Clemson will have to win the offensive rebounding matchup if they want to win. P.J. Allen and Shefflin have got to dominate the boards. Yep, that's it. I 100% agree. Uh, can we briefly discuss how Sanford got robbed on that late chase down block that got called a foul down one? Yes, we can, Wesley. In fact, I already did back in the first hour of the show. Uh, yes, Sanford got screwed on that. Sanford absolutely had a clean block. They would have had the ball back down one with 14 seconds, which is plenty of time to run and execute an offense for a single bucket. You would have had the opportunity there for a buzzer beater upset. That was a weak ass foul call. I could not agree more. Uh, yes, I do. Man, check this out. You're on official Rob Brown lockdown. Manufactured here we go. For the Carolinas. Show. All right, ladies and gentlemen, our numero trace of the Rob Brown Show is underway. It is the Fan Upstate. Welcome back, my friends, to the show that ends in two hours, as a matter of fact, if you're keeping track, but a busy two hours. We have got lined up for you at the end of this hour of the show. We are going to be joined by Brandon Fricky. He is a captain for your, my hour Greenville triumph. We'll talk with Brandon Fricky about their win over in Columbia on Wednesday, moving on to round two of the Lamar hunt U S open cup championship. We'll talk to him about this Saturday as the triumph return home for a Saturday night matchup against rivals forward Madison. Stay tuned for that interview at the end of this hour. Then at the uh, nine o'clock hour at the nine o'clock hour, we will be joined by the host of the brand new show starting on Monday wire to wire with diesel and Cole Bryson diesel and CB going to join us right here on the Rob Brown show. We'll talk a little bit about that new show that they are starting on Monday. We'll talk a little bit about the future of the show and the station. And of course, we'll talk some sports because it is a sports talk radio show. Diesel and Cole will be joining us at 9 a.m. to talk about their new show, Wire to Wire. Really looking forward to that conversation. Let's get into this uh, Shohei Otani story for just a minute, shall we? Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, I'm going to sit back in the chair to chat about this one because uh, the tea is good, as the kids are saying. So, 
We found out yesterday that Shohei Otani, well, I guess two nights ago, technically, that Shohei Otani's longtime interpreter, a man who had been accompanying him around the world throughout his career, dating back to 2000 and what was it, 2011, those guys got hooked up, gets fired. And he gets fired because and only because $4.5 million had been transferred out of Shohei Otani's bank accounts via wire transfers to an illegal gambling outfit. 4.5 mil. Now, this is where the story starts to get very fun, interesting, entertaining, uh, controversial, conspiratorial, whatever you want to call it. The story goes sideways because in an interview that Shohei's interpreter gave a day before the firing was announced, he said that Shohei Otani knew about the $4.5 million. Not only knew about the $4.5 million, but orchestrated the $4.5 million transfer of funds. Shohei's interpreter said that he had gotten into that much gambling debt to the tune of $4.5 million. And he said that Shohei, my buddy, my pal, my amigo, my compatriot, my colleague, my friend, Shohei was disappointed. He was mad. He was upset. He was disappointed. But at the end of the day, he wanted to get me out of this situation. And so he agreed to pay off my gambling debt with the promise that I would, you know, not gamble anymore. Well, it turned out that those payments were illegal. And then, wouldn't you know it, all of the sudden, Shohei Otani, he suddenly had no idea what was going on. In fact, he had so no idea what was going on that the interpreter changed his story. All of a sudden, the story was that Shohei Otani did not know about the $4.5 million. It initially was he made the wire himself. Now it's he didn't know about the wire at all. Then yesterday, the news broke that Shohei Otani uh, and his representatives had reached out to law enforcement and were asking law enforcement to open up an investigation into charges of grand theft, effectively saying that $4.5 million was stolen from Shohei Otani. There's a couple of things that set off some bells and whistles for me, to be quite honest with you. There's a couple of things that set, that set off some bells and whistles for me. Uh, the first, obviously, and I think this is probably true for everybody who's um, not, uh, not uh, an idiot. It is the fact that this story not only got changed, but it got changed at the source. And it got changed at the source, not while there was like an ongoing investigation into it. It happens all the time. That somebody tells the story, somebody spills the tea, so to speak, about a story like this. And then after that story gets spilled and an investigation gets launched, then all of the sudden the perpetrator in question suddenly remembers some details that he may or may not have forgotten to mention during the first round of interviews. Uh, I don't know how many of y'all have seen the show, The First 48. The First 48 uh, is a murder mystery reality detective. I don't know how to put it. Long story short, the show claims that after a murder takes place, that investigators have 48 hours to solve the crime. And after 48 hours, uh, the chances 
that the crime gets solved drop off dramatically, like to the exponential percentage chance. And so the investigators basically don't sleep. They go all in for 48 hours to try to figure it out before they get there. So one of the things that happens in this show, because I will acknowledge that uh, unfortunately your boy is, as the kids say, basic. Uh, in fact, I was called not too long ago by a teenage niece of mine, quote, basic AF Rob, which is uh, true and fine. Uh, my feelings are perfectly fine. Uh, don't worry about it, Ashley. I feel great. Anyway, I love true crime documentaries. And I recently started going back and catching up on episodes of the first 48. I enjoy the show. Okay. And a lot of the episodes were filmed in neighborhoods down around where I grew up, which should not make me more entertained. But again, basic, it does. All right. So one of my favorite things is the interrogation process that happens during that first 48 hours. And very frequently what will happen is they'll find somebody that can be loosely placed uh, at the scene of the crime. They'll find somebody who was spotted by a witness or somebody whose phone GPS tagged them as being nearby or whatever the case might be. And they bring that person in and they say, hey, tell us what happened. And that person, oh, I just, I met him for a burger. We were just going to go have a chat. We were going to, we were just meeting up. It was just a little meet and greet. And then the next day, investigators go and they find surveillance footage taken by a camera attached to the fast food joint across the street. And it shows this person hanging out on that corner for three or four hours before the victim gets there. And then they call that guy back in and they go, hey, you told us that it was just a, a little bit of a meet and greet, but now we have video footage. You were actually there for like three hours before. What's up with that? And now the person suddenly goes, oh, well, I mean, I was there. I forgot I was there, but I was just, you know, I was just getting a burger. And then the footage comes out later of them putting on a, a, a hood or, or pulling up a hoodie or whatever. And then they got more details. That's kind of how the game gets played, right? Uh, but ordinarily, more information, more facts about the case aren't delivered until there's an investigation going on. And the investigators come forward and say, well, actually... During the course of our investigation, we found this, and then the person suddenly remembers more details. And that would be one thing, except for there's no investigation going on right now. Law enforcement was tipped off, but they were not asked to step in and do anything until yesterday. And the announcement that the interpreter had changed his story came out before that, at least according to the timeline that I saw yesterday. So that means that said interpreter either knew there was an investigation coming and was trying to jump out ahead of this whole thing, or there's something else at play here. Now, as I've said a couple of times, I do not particularly care if Shohei Otani or anyone else is gambling. I do not care that you are gambling until you ruin your life gambling, which is why I say if you have an addictive personality and you can't not gamble, then don't gamble. Don't even start, all right? But if you're able to do like I do and you throw a couple hundred bucks a month at bets and if you lose it, no harm, no foul, it was just my play money because I don't go to the movies anymore then fine, have that. I don't care if Shoei Otani was gambling. I care if and only if he was gambling on baseball. That's it. I only care if he was gambling on baseball. So I'm fine with the investigation uh, to, to, to find out, A, was Shohei Otani actually gambling and he is setting his boy up to be the fall guy? Why would he do that, Rob? You might ask. And I might answer, there's one very good reason. 
if this is the case, and this guy takes the fall for Shohei Otani, he would be in jail for a couple of years. Probably not much longer than a couple of years because while it is $4.5 million, I don't think that the illegal gambling is going to stick old boy in prison for decades. Shohei Otani, you will recall, deferred like 90 some odd percent of his salary from the LA Dodgers to a later date. Meaning that Shohei is only getting a couple of million dollars over the next couple of years. But in a decade, when he's done playing, Shohei Otani is then going to be owed like a billion dollars from the LA Dodgers. If you're the fall guy and Shohei comes to an arrangement with you, hey man, if I go to jail, I can't make a billion dollars. If you go to jail, I can make a billion dollars. So, hey, if you to go to jail for me, I will pay you a quarter of a billion dollars, right? I will pay you a quarter of a bill or a tenth of a bill or whatever the number they agree on might be. It would make perfect sense that this guy would be willing to take a nine, ten figure paycheck uh to be the to 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 be the fall guy for Shohei Otani so that Shohei can keep playing baseball, keep making them millions of dollars and then pay him down the line for his quote unquote services. That's interesting. As Nolan just said in the stream chat a minute ago, 2 years in jail for a couple of milli sounds good to me. Yeah, a lot of people. A lot of people. I will tell you uh the 4 years that I have lived here in the upstate of South Carolina have absolutely flown by. I'll tell you right now, there's some people in my life that would hate it. Brandon, I would give up two years in jail for $50 million. I'd absolutely I would do it. not. I absolutely would. Um, the rest of my life on $50 million is set, catered, paid for. I'd never work another day. I would consider it two years of work for $50 million. Yes, I would do that. I would do that today. Not a so, question. With regards to this whole thing going on, um, personally, I feel that the first story with the interpreter, I believe that's the actual story. Um, I believe uh, because it's so in depth and detail that, um, I mean, only the interpreter and only Otani know what exactly happened. And I also think maybe Otani is partially to blame for the gambling as well. Now, I'm with you. I don't care about him gambling. However, if it is on baseball, you got to worry because, you know, didn't Pete Rose bet on baseball and now look at him? So that brings me to something else that I am very intrigued by. The something else that I'm very intrigued by is the fact that Rob Manfred has not yet launched an investigation into this. Okay. If this was anybody else, if this was Gavin Lux, if this was Andrew McCutcheon, if this was Cody Bellinger, pick your poison. If this was anybody else, I truly genuinely believe Rob Manford would have already launched a whole ass investigation into it. They would have been doing everything in their power to talk to federal authorities. They'd have been doing everything in their power to talk to local law enforcement authorities. They'd have been doing everything in their power to talk to everybody they could to see if they could connect Shohei Otani to gambling on baseball. Without a doubt, they would be trying to connect that because they absolutely want to know, was Shohei gambling on the game? Was he breaking the rules that, as you just pointed out, are they breaking the rules that we have quite literally locked other people out of the league forever for violating? And if the answer is yes, they'd have to go get this guy. But it's Shohei Otani. Shohei Otani at a point in time where I very firmly believe Major League Baseball is looking at international expansion, right? I got asked on BetMGM tonight, last night, why are we playing games in Korea two weeks before the regular or a week before 
the regular season starts for the other 28 teams across baseball? And my answer was, because I think, much like the NBA has already announced they are doing, much like the NFL has been doing, taking the NFL regular season games to Europe the last few years, I believe Major League Baseball is looking at international expansion maybe not directly like the nba is looking at propping up a standalone league in europe in order to find and develop the best european talent i wouldn't be shocked if baseball's doing the same thing and considering the massive influence over the last couple of years of asian baseball it would make sense that asia might be the first continent that they decide to try this out in so why not send maybe the most well-known Asian athlete on the face of the planet, Shohei Otani, to Asia just to see the, what the reaction is, right? If baseball is looking at expanding internationally, the biggest asset they have is Shohei Otani. You can send Shohei Otani anywhere in Asia, and he could go grab a mic and fart into it, and it would sell out a baseball stadium, all right? It just is what it is. So my thought is, or, 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 or my conspiracy theory brain has kicked in and said, all right, when you are setting down guys for a career, for gambling on the game, and here's a cat who clearly has the money, here's a cat that even if indirectly is, is connected to an illegal gambling outlet, you launch if you're Rob Manford, an immediate investigation, immediate. I'm going directly to Shohei, directly to the translator. I want the records from the feds. I want everything I can get my stupid hands on so that I can look. And if I find one amount of evidence, one instance of evidence that Shohei Otani was betting on baseball, you got to go all in on the cat. The problem is Shohei Otani is worth well over $1 billion to Major League Baseball. He's a walking billion-dollar check to them. Nobody else in Major League Baseball is that valuable. Not Aaron Judge, not Ronald Acuna Jr., not Mookie Betts, not Adley Rushman. No one else is in baseball is worth as much to MLB as Shohei Otani. So I think it's fair now at this point, and you guys know I try to avoid conspiracies to the best of my ability. I think it is very fair at this point to ask if Rob Manfred is trying to protect Shohei Otani here. Are you not launching a full-scale investigation when you yourself have said for years that this is something that cannot be tolerated in Major League Baseball are you yourself avoiding Shohei in order to protect Shohei? Because if the answer to that is yes, all of a sudden, it is one more instance, much like John Fisher, where Major League Baseball is saying the quiet part out loud, money is more important than ethics. And that would be a, uh, I was going to say it would be a very sad revelation. It's not a revelation to any of us. It's kind of one of those things that we all know it's happening. We all accept it's happening, and we all just don't want to talk about it. That's kind of how it feels to me. We will talk more about that uh, later on, but we got to run to a break. When we come back here in just a minute, got a few more things I want to run through. Brandon Fricky from the Greenville Triumph is going to join us in the final segment of this hour of the radio broadcast. We got Diesel and Cole joining us on the stream coming up at 9 a.m. to talk about their new show, Wire to Wire. It's going to be busy. Y'all stick around. The Rob Brown Show carries on. It is the Fan Upstate. Thank you, Wesley. Breaking out the uh, the modern day Peaky Blinders look. Wink, wink. <laughs> hey, uh, Rob. The first forty-eight is filmed. Majority in Atlanta. That they filming it is by my wife's old job in downtown Atlanta. And so she actually got to see them the film that this. show.
They did uh they did one a number of years ago, but they did one in New Orleans um a handful of years ago on the same street that one of my cousins lives on. Oh wow. Like three houses now. Like you could see her house in the episode multiple times. Mm. My uh I had a old player I coached at Avondale High School football and they fe they featured his story on there. Uh he was murdered. He was shot 50 times at his house. Well, that's tragic. Yeah, it was sad. All right, guys, we're going to step away for just a minute. Y'all stay right there. We will be right back. Thanks for hanging out. Clemson is in my final four. Hashtag Homer. <laughs> Robert Half is here to help. At Robert Half, we know talent. Visit roberthalf.com today. Sponsored by ChumbaCasino.com. Play social games online for free. Head to ChumbaCasino.com now to join the Chumba. All right, come back. Plus. Rise and shine, sports fans. Grab your coffee and a jolt of sports on the Rob Brown Show. It puts me in my zone. It gets me uh, ready for the day. On the fan, upstate. The Rob Brown Show back on your radio. It is the fan upstate. Rob and Brandon here with you. Alonzo rejoins the show coming up on Monday. Let's get to uh, let's get to this story real quick. This is pretty interesting. We talked a little bit a couple of weeks ago about the allegations of tampering filed against the Atlanta Falcons for the deal that led up to the signing of their new QB one, 
Kirk Cousins away from Minnesota. Yesterday, Mike Florio made it a little bit more interesting. Sports analyst for an NBA insider and, uh, oh, excuse me, NBC sports insider. Florio's not that busy. Uh, Mike Florio has questioned the legitimacy of the Atlanta Falcons acquisition of Vikings quarterback Kirk Cousins during the NFL free agency. Uh, his suspicions have nothing to do with the contract or the deal or the actual signing. Florio said, quote, this is the most blatant case of tampering I've ever seen. End quote. Direct quote from Mike Florio. He was on a podcast the other day when he brought that up on the uh, What the Football with Amy Trask and Susie Schuster podcast. He said, quote, the Falcons' pursuit of Kirk Cousins, to me, doing this 23 years, it's the most blatant case of tampering I've ever seen. Where Kirk Cousins at his introductory press conference admits he spoke to and possibly met with, he might have blurted out that he met with the team's head athletic trainer doing the 52-hour negotiating window where you're not supposed to talk to the player at all. We played that audio for you. We talked about it last week. When it happened, Kirk Cousins said the day after the tampering period that he had already had a conversation with some wonderful people inside of the organization, including the head athletic trainer. And that set off a lot of bells for a lot of people because it was during a period of time where Kirk Cousins was not permitted to talk to anybody. Florio went on to say that there was, quote, tampering within tampering as Atlanta Falcons director of player personnel, Ryan Pace, brought in wide receiver Darnell Moody to Atlanta as well during that non-tampering period. Florio went on to say he talked to Ryan Pace, the director of player personnel, presumably during the 52-hour window, and someone enlisted him to recruit Darnell Mooney from the Bears. So you've got tampering within tampering. You've got multiple levels of tampering, and he just talks, and he talked about it openly like they just didn't care. It was so blatant, and he said Kyle Pitts was recruiting him weeks in advance. If he did that at the behest of the team or with the knowledge of the team, that's another tampering violation. So... This is interesting because if tampering charges are brought and proven against the Atlanta Falcons, which I suspect the NFL will indeed investigate at some point, uh, I would be interested to see what type of punishment might be brought down. If they would uh, undo the contract of Kirk Cousins and forbid him from signing there, I genuinely don't know how harsh the NFL would get. I don't know if it would be a gigantic fine, a salary cap reduction, a loss of draft picks. What I do know is at a point in time where the Atlanta Falcons are the odds on favorites to win this division next year. And if they're not, I'm going to throw a lot of money at them for it because I think they are and they should be. But at a point in time where the Falcons are in a very good spot to raise themselves out of perennial mediocrity and actually win a division, even if it's only because the division is ass around the other three teams, and it is, this would be a real, real bad time for the Falcons to get caught violating the tampering restrictions and take any type of punishment you need all the draft picks you can get to build around Kirk Cousins because the window is open now and not for very long you need all that you can get right now uh in terms of salary cap money so that you can sign weapons to help out with Kirk Cousins because there are a lot of folks who believe the Falcons are close but still need a few more pieces you need everything you can get if you're going to make a run because your window is probably one year, two year at most. Brandon noted Atlanta Falcons fan. Brandon, what's your thoughts on this? See, I'm kind of torn about it. Um, I'm a huge Falcons fan, as you know. Um, and uh, if tampering has happened, uh, I can see a um, 
a significant fine coming down. I think there was a team that recently was caught tampering and they had they they got like what, a million dollar fine or more. Um, and then they lost a fifth or sixth round pick, which I could see happening for Atlanta. Um, I mean, even the uh, the Calvin Ridley um, debacle that happened, uh, how uh, he now signs with Tennessee, Atlanta gets a third round draft pick. Um, I could see Atlanta losing that third round draft pick and being fined one, maybe $2 million because of the tampering. Now, do I think that it's tampering instead of tampering if uh, Kyle Pitts has talked? No. Because every player talks. They all talk. We have no idea what they talk about. Um, so I don't think that should be counted against Atlanta. But if they did, in fact, um, talk to Kirk Cousins and the NFL finds it out, I would not put it, be putting it past them if they got a $1 or $2 million fine and lose a third or maybe even a fifth-round pick. So here is here is what we've got. Here are some of the most recent tampering accusations and punishments from the last couple of years. Uh, in 2023, Philadelphia accused the Arizona Cardinals of tampering with defensive coordinator John Gannon, whom the Cardinals ultimately hired as their head coach. The two sides eventually agreed to a settlement in which the Eagles traded the number 94 pick in the 2023 draft and a 2024 fifth round selection for the number 66 pick in 2023. In 2016, the Kansas City Chiefs were found to have tampered with Eagles free agent wide receiver Jeremy Macklin during the previous offseason. Philadelphia did not receive compensation for the Chiefs, but the Chiefs were docked third and sixth round picks and fined $250,000. Andy Reid fired 70, uh, fined $75,000, and GM John Dorsey was fined $25,000. Back in 2002, maybe the most notable NFL tampering case so far. In 2022, the league punished the Miami Dolphins for trying to lure then New England Patriots quarterback Tom Brady and then New Orleans Saints head coach Sean Payton down to South Beach. The Dolphins were docked a first round pick in 2023 and a fourth round pick of 2024, Stephen Ross was suspended and fined $1.5 million, while Dolphins executive Bruce Beal was fined half a million dollars and was ultimately banned from the NFL Fort. So this is absolutely something that uh, has happened. It's absolutely something that the NFL takes very seriously. And it is something that if it turns out that the Falcons did indeed have improper conversations with Kirk Cousins before signing him, the Falcons could end up being obligated to either send picks to Minnesota as compensation for that tampering or just lose picks in general at a point in time where, like I said, the window's open, but the window is open for one year. It's open for one year and one year only, and that's a big problem. All right, we'll see how it plays out. We'll talk more about it later on. Let's take a break. When we come back here in a minute, Brandon Fricky is the captain of your, my, our Greenville Triumph. Brandon Fricky joins the show to talk about the Triumph's road win this past Wednesday night in Columbia. Talk about the upcoming match against Ford Madison. Talk about new coach Rick Wright and the success the team is having out of the gate underneath Coach Wright. We'll talk about all that with Brandon Fricky when we come back on the Rob Brown Show and the Fan Up State. This is WWE Intercontinental Champion, the Ring General Gunter, and you're listening to the Rob Brown Show on the Fan Up State. All right, guys, we're going to step away for just a minute while we get Brandon Fricky lined up. Y'all stay right there. We will be right back. <music>
Get the one and done you want for your dog's monthly protection. Next Guard Plus, a Fox Alarm or Moxie Vectin and Pyrantal Chewable Tablet. Protects against fleas, ticks, heartworm disease, roundworms, and hookworms. All in one delicious, beef flavored soft chew. Use the caution in dogs with a history of seizures or neurologic disorders. Dogs should be tested for existing heartworm infection prior to one minute. Getting quality employees to fill positions in your company is essential, but finding those people can be a major hassle. Unless you use ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter makes finding quality people a breeze. ZipRecruiter's advanced technology identifies candidates with the right skills, sends you great matches, then you can easily invite them to apply. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. See for yourself. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash free to try ZipRecruiter for free. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash free. Heard the catchphrase. I respect that, Wesley. That's a fan. <laughs> I like that. People are saving Dipping golf. I dig it. Jackson Hewitt, because they love saving money on tax prep. Do you love saving money? Then switch to Jackson Hewitt today and pay less than last year. Thousands of 15 seconds. Hey, if he if he says that there's an echo in his phone, mm -hmm. what you'll have to do is whenever he's answering a question, take it out of utility. Uh huh. Oh, okay. No, that won't work. Is it? Well, he just won't be able to hear it on the stream. We'll yeah. Out. We're back. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. The Rob Brown Show is on your radio. It is the Fan Upstate. Rob Brown, Brandon, filling in for the great one, Lonzo. He will uh, return to us on Monday. Now we go to the phone lines. We welcome in the man who wears the armband for your, my, our Greenville Triumph. He is Brandon Fricky joining us here on the Rob Brown Show in the Fan Up State. Brandon, what's up, big fella? Morning, Rob. How you doing, man? Thanks for having I'm me on. I'm in the dream, buddy. I'm doing real good. I don't know that I'm doing as good as you guys, 2-0 and after a win at home to open it after a win on the road in the U.S. Uh, in the US Open Cup. How the boys feeling going 2-0 and out of the gate, pal? Yeah, I mean, obviously it's great just to have a good start like that. Get get the first couple wins under your belt, um, you know, gives you a boost and, and really helps with, with you know, all the work we put in. It kind of shows a reward for that. So, you know, it's great. Um, you know, we're not naive, though. We know we still have a lot of work to do. Um, and, you know, but it definitely gives you a, definitely gives you a little added motivation to keep doing it because, you know, if you do the work, you're going to get a result. So, you know, we're going to keep working and hopefully keep getting some wins. I love that. Uh, we had Rick Wright on the show last week, Brandon, and and I love the theme we have had between our talk with Sebastian Velasquez, our talk with Coach Wright, our talk with you now. Every one of you guys has leaned on work and effort and continuing to just grind and get the fundamentals down and do everything right. Uh, it, has that kind of become like a like a like a like a motto, like an anthem for this Triumph team this year? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I think, you you know, everyone knows we, we have a bit of new faces, um, you know, starting a new season. And, you know, it's important that, that everyone's bought in, um, you know, if we're going to go in the right direction. And the, the best way to buy in is to do the work. And that's kind of something that we emphasize, um, you know, from some of the older guys and, and Coach Wright is if everyone buys in and does the work, um, the results will come. You know, we have a good staff around us and a lot of good players. So, you know, we kind of said, you got to do, you know, the work and 
the results will come then. So, you know, I think it's really good to see that the guys have bought in thus far. Um, you know, and, and like I said, it once you start to see good results from that, it kind of leads on to itself. So it's something we hope to keep building on and, you know, see some good results as we go. We're talking with Brandon Fricky of the Greenville Triumph. Talk to me a little bit about that. You, you you mentioned new faces. Obviously, those have been following this team for years. Recognize there are still the Tyler Pollocks on this team, but there are the Sebastian Velasquez's and and the the new guys, the younger guys specifically uh, that have showed up. Guys like Mohamed Say that we're waiting to see uh, kind of how they fit into the role. For you, for a veteran, for a guy who's been around for a couple of years, what is your role in trying to bridge the gap between the old uh the old guard of the triumph while you get the new guys up to speed on what it means to be a member of this club yeah um you know obviously it's crucial for for those of us that have been around and and been a part of you know the early success of this club to to bring all the positives and good stuff from those first years that we were so successful um you know it, it's really important that we lean on that and, and the experience we had then um, with Coach Harks and whatnot and, and kind of bringing that and then blending in some new flavor, obviously. You know, some of these younger players or, or new faces, they have played with good clubs or they've played with good colleges and, and they have, you know, some experiences that we need to lend into too. So, like you said, it's kind of blending them together in that we want to bring a lot of the good that we, you know, we, we've had in the past, but also bring in some of this new that, you know, can bring some new ideas, some fresh some fresh flavor and and just try and mold the two. So it, it's a bit of a experimentation process, you could say. It's just bring, bringing some of the old and some of the new. And, you know, it's a, it's a process at the end of the day. But um, so far it's been, you know, it's exciting. And day to day it's nice to, you know, like I said, have some, some fresh faces and some new ideas around and, you know, stuff we can, we can build on as a unit. And I think a lot of those new guys, especially the guys that have played pro and, and seen the success of this club, you know, they came here for a reason and they want to, they want to continue to build on that success, um, you know, and reignite some of the fire that, that we've had. And, you know, we're going to, we're going to expect them to do that. So, you know, as a unit, um, blending those two things together, I think only makes us better. We are talking with Brandon Fricky of the Greenville Triumph. Uh, Brandon, let's let's catch up on this year. Let's go back to the opening match uh, at home against Spokane, a, a game where I think Spokane gifted a, a questionable PK to put you guys down in a 1-0 hole. I asked Rick Wright about this, and he said that the attitude in the locker room was guys with heads up. It was guys saying we're better than they are. It was guys challenging each other to up the level of competition to make sure that they were good, that y'all were good in the second half. Talk to me a little bit about what you remember going into that halftime, down a goal, going down into the opening match of Rick Wright's era, down a goal. Can you t can you talk to us a little bit about if you felt the same way as Rick Wright said the club did? Yeah, I think 100%. Um, you know, it's it's never, like you said, it's not the ideal start, right? You come out, you're at home, um, the new era, you, you want to – you want it to go right. And the first thing that happens is you kind of get punched in the face. Um, and I think in reality, that's, that's also a really good thing. And it helped test our team and test if we really were about what we've been talking about and that we're going to keep going no matter what, we're going to trust the process. Um, you know, despite the result, we're going to, we're going to keep playing and working and doing, doing what we've been doing. And that if we, if we do that, we, we trust that the results will come. And I think, you know, it was an early time. Brandon, did we lose him or did I just we just keep him? playing? No, he's there. Right, Brandon, keep going. We had a disconnect. Keep going, bud. Good. Um, no, I was just saying that. You know, I think it was a it was a good test for sure. Um, I think uh, you know it was an early test, and and it was something that you know we we had talked about is that despite how games and and results are going at times, we need to trust in kind of the process and how we play and how we work together as a unit. Um, and I think you know, that, that was a testament to that and that it was early, it was at home and, you know, it's not the perfect start. Right. But we had to, 
we had to sit down and say we got to keep going and and luckily we responded really well in the first half and got the goal back and made it even and then from there I think that kind of showed us okay everything's fine we just need to keep doing our thing and, and we'll be all right and then obviously the second half we were able to get a couple more goals and come away with the win so you know in hindsight you know it's not obviously the way you want to start but it's it's a good show of adversity and how, how can this group react to it because you never know sometimes with a new group um despite all the things you talk about and work on and so i think it was a it was a really good test and and i think we're all kind of glad that it happened early um because i think it gives us a little bit of confidence that if we get in that situation again we're going to be all right we just need to keep doing what we do Brandon Fricky from the Greenville Triumph here on the Rob Brown Show with the Fan Up State. Brandon, obviously you were around for the John Harks era, carry forward into Rick Wright. Obviously, I, I, I think, I assume, beneficial that Rick was around to see what John Harks was doing to make sure this team is a perennial contender in the playoffs. But obviously, taking over the reins as the gaffer, he's going to have his own ideas, his own thoughts. Can you talk to me a little bit about where... Uh, Rick Wright and John Harks are similar coaches and what some of the differences are that fans that are outside of the dressing room may or may not notice. Yeah, I, I think uh, one of the things you touched on early um, was just kind of the work ethic and, and that in the end, the bare minimum is that we're going to be one of the hardest working um, groups in the league. And I think that's, that's something that both John and, and Rick both share is that that's, that's the bare minimum, right? Is you have to work, you have to put in the effort in order to get results. Um, and they both preach that daily. Um, as as you mentioned before, um, you know, difference wise, it's, it's, it's not, you know, there's, there's obviously some, some little tactical things that they both kind of prefer different that comes down to each person, but you know, all in all, Rick's just, he's been around the game a lot and, um, has experiences. So he kind of, he kind of leaves it to us to do things. And then, um he kind of then chimes in when he when he sees things that he wants done differently or corrected so it's a it's a free-flowing experience um and you know i think some of the guys have enjoyed that um and a little more experimentation and and trying to get things right and then obviously if he sees things he 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 steps in and um kind of says you know his piece and where he'd like it to be so um all in all they you know it's all based on kind of like you said the work ethic and the and the effort and then you know some little tweaks here and there and and i think rick's also built a really good staff around him um that have helped and kept on some people and then brought in some some new faces with some some fresh ideas as well and we're trying to you know eat up that information and and you know make it useful to the group so that we can keep moving forward Brandon Fricky from the Greenville Triumph talking to us here on the Rob Brown Show on the Fan Up State. Got a couple more minutes here, Brandon. Uh, that U.S. Open Cup game over in Columbia, I want to ask about that, and then we'll shift ahead to Ford Madison this Saturday night mm-hmm. at Paladin Stadium. How important is that tournament to you guys? Because I know that, you know, there, there, there's obviously with every level being involved, it is something that fans put a lot of emphasis on. At the same time, I know that with these matches falling in the middle of the schedule you got to play Wednesday turn around and play a home game that counts on the USL League One table on Saturday I also noticed it was a starting 11 and you boys went out there to play like it was a game that you wanted to win what is the view of the club on the importance of of playing well in that tournament yeah I think you know first of all for me personally it's a it's a very I, I love the tournament I think it's I've played at you know at the semi-professional and amateur ranks in the tournament and gotten to play professional clubs and I've seen what it's all about. So um, you know it, it holds a, a special place for me and I think it's a tournament that gives a lot of players um, and clubs opportunities to to showcase um, what they're about and and you know earn opportunities higher. So I I think it's a it's a very very cool um, and fun tournament to be involved in and. Um, you know, as a club, I think our approach is always to win every game. And, you know, at the end of the day, we trust, we trust all the players to do that. Um, you mentioned, you know, some, some schedule congestion, um, at the end of the day, this was only our second game of the year. So, you know, Rick was, you know, kind of on, on the page that we still had a lot to to work on and continue building fitness. Um, you know, as, as hopefully we continue to advance, um, you know, we just, 
it's up to the players to be available and be fit. And then obviously that comes down to, to Rick and, you know, the fitness staff to determine um, how we utilize individual guys. But, um, you know, our goal as a club is to win every game, right? No matter who we put out there um, and, and trust that guys are going to do the job. Um, so, you know, moving forward, how we approach it, we'll see. But, you know, that first game obviously was we need to come out and continue to build on what we did the weekend prior and, um, you know, continue to work on things. And, you know, to be fair, we knew it was going to be a tough game. They always are. Um, you're going away. You're going to a team that has a lot to prove, um, you know, new environment. And so, and that's what it was. They, you know, they made it difficult for us, um, but it was, a, it was a really fun game. You know, it was very open cup uh, type environment. And I really enjoyed it. And I think a lot of the guys did too. Um, it was a grind. It was a battle. Um, and we were, we were happy to get out of there with a win. For the record, Brandon Fricky, when old boy took down and then stepped over Sebastian on the sideline, I thought I was about to watch you and Leo end a man's career on television, bud. How close did you come? Uh, you know, obviously it was a heat of the moment, right? Um, the tackle I actually thought was a pretty fair. It was a firm tackle. Um, you know, it comes down to, like I said, they were trying to – they were trying to kind of, you know, do what they could to to manipulate the game, you could say, and get us out of our uh, comfort zone. I I think as as teammates, we didn't really appreciate the whole standing over him bit, and that's where we got a bit fired up and felt we wanted to come in and defend Sebastian a little bit, um, you know, and show him that we had his back at the end of the day, um, you know, and then it's obviously just a bit of a scuffle from there, and you know, a few guys acting like they're tough guys, but it's all, it's all part of the game. It's fun. Um, you know, just trying to defend our teammates and, and let them know we, we got their back, um, especially our skillful players that are going to, going to end up getting kicked here and there during the season. Um, you know, it's always good to show them that, you know, they got the support of their teammates. Brandon Fricky from the Greenville Triumph. You guys at home this Saturday night, taking on forward Madison game number two, on the USL league draw. How important is it for you guys to carry that momentum forward and make sure that you start two and O in this, uh, in this league? Yeah, um, it's really important. Obviously also being at home, you know, we, we, we felt last year, we, we've discussed this as a group that at home, we weren't, we weren't as strong as we could be. Um, so we're, we're trying to come in with a more conscious mentality this year that, you know, we want to make, we want to make our home field a, a more difficult place to play at for opposing teams. So, um, you know, both at the start of the year and trying to get off to a good start and then trying to establish, you know, kind of that home field uh, defense is, is really important for us. Um, you know, so we want to keep going. I think it's going to be a very tough game. Madison are a good squad. They've made some, some really strong additions this year. Um, and it's going to be, it's going to be a fun game though. It's going to be a test for both teams and, um, you know, we look forward to it from that aspect. Brandon Fricky, your Greenville Triumph. They are again at home this Saturday night against Ford Madison at Paladin Stadium on the lovely campus of Furman University. You can get your tickets right now at GreenvilleTriumph.com. More importantly, come meet us at the tailgate and shotgun some beers before the game. Not you, Brandon. You're busy. Don't come shotgun beers with <laughs> us. You go win a game. But Maybe everybody else come do Maybe it. After. Brandon, great to have you back on the show, bud. I appreciate it. Great to talk to you, man. Good luck Saturday night, pal. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Rob. Have a good one, man. Anytime, always. Brandon Fricky, one of my favorites to talk to from your my hour, Greenville Triumph. When we come back here in just mere moments from now, we are going to be joined by not one, but two different legends, the brand new host of our brand new show, Wire to Wire with Say whichever name you want to fur say first, Diesel and Cole, Cole and Diesel. We'll talk to both of them when we come back on the Rob Brown Show in the Fan Upstate. The show hey, Otani story grew more interesting yesterday after the announcement that Otani's interpreter was fired. Otani's representatives requested police look into allegations of massive theft related to the four and a half million dollars paid to an illegal gambling outfit. That comes after Otani's interpreter initially said Shohei knew about the payment, but then changed his story later saying he did not. It's one and done for the Gamecocks of South Carolina on the men's hardwood as they fall to number 11 Oregon yesterday, 87-73. Former Gamecock turned Doug Jermaine Cousinard became just the fourth Pac-12 player in history with a 40-point game in the tournament. Meechie Johnson led all Gamecocks with 24. Taylon Cooper had 15. B.J. Mack had 13. 
The Gamecocks shot 44% from the floor, 46% from deep, but were out-rebounded and had more turnovers than Oregon. And the U.S. men's national team knocked off Jamaica 3-1 in a CONCACAF Nations League game last night, waited after giving up a 30-second goal until the stoppage time period to equalize, got two in the extra time for the win, both scored by Haji Wright. We're back after this on the Rob Brown Show in the Fan Upstate. You're clear. All right, guys, we're going to step away for just a minute. We're going to get Diesel and Cole lined up. We'll come back and fun and shenanigans will abound. Stay right there. What's up, buddy? Cole, we will allow you to talk if you want to say hi to people. Oh, it said my internet stream was bad. Can you hear me? Well, I can. I can tell that you like. What? 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 What bunker are you in right now, pal? So I'm in the Omni. I'm trying to find a place to um, be be quiet, but this this place. It's too frou frou for me. I've already been looked at and judged this morning. You want to know why? Look at look at the humble brag from Cole. Oh, I'm in the Omni. I can't find walking around shoeless like a freaking bum. What are we doing, Cole? Hey, speaking of bum, Louisville is the biggest dump of a city in the world. Oh, let me say that. <laughs> I don't know, man. I'll put I'll put Jacksonville up against Louisville any day of the week. This place is a dump, man. Phil's small accounting firm is growing in numbers. I mean, it's terrible. What is wrong with Louisville, Kentucky? How you say it? Louisville. This might be the worst segment of radio ever, me trying to find a place where people aren't hearing me. I'm going to go in this ballroom. There it is. 30 seconds. This and be the good. bearded one who comes <sighs> headsetted and microphoned like a professional. What up, Diesel? I, hey, I Diesel, just swore you said we're doing this at 9.50. No, Can you man, get a bigger microphone, Diesel? <laughs> <laughs> 10 seconds. Right here. That's perfect. Can you get a bigger mic? Coming back. The official sports voice of you, you, the Upstate fan. CBS Sports Radio. Always live from the Free Odyssey app. Man, check this out. For an official Rob Brown lockdown. Who represents being real? Yeah. The unfiltered sports talk. Manufactured locally for the Carolinas. Lockdown! This is the Rob Brown Show. Get yeah, Rob. Only. The fan. 
The fourth to final hour of the Rob Brown radio program goes now, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. This is the Fan Upstate Spectacular, as always, to have you on a Friday. And this next, I don't know, 5, 10, 15, 20, 60 minutes, who knows, might get a little bit weird. Why? Because... Starting on Monday, there's a new radio program that is going to air right here on the Fan Upstate every weekday from 3 until 7 p.m. Our colleague, our comrade, our compatriot, Mark Ryan, of course, as you have heard already, moving on and up to Detroit, Michigan to become a hockey guy. Remember to tell you, uh, remember to, or I'll tell, remember to tell you that story here in just a minute because I had a conversation with him yesterday that was beyond hilarious and I'm very excited about it. Um... We are going to be replacing that show with a brand new show. A show that is called Wire to Wire. And you know it is hip and it's cool and it's new age because it's spelled with the number two instead of the word and hosted uh, by a couple of voices you guys have heard many times. Sometimes you've enjoyed it. Sometimes you haven't. Cole Bryson and Diesel are here. And uh, Diesel, my apologies, but I'm going to start with Cole because for some reason, Cole is in Louisville, Kentucky. And when I asked him about it, he it's pronounced went... Louisville. No, I don't care how the people <laughs> in Louisville ask me. Louisville. It is Louisville. He's Diesel, in Louisville, asking about Louisville, Louisville, Kentucky, which he described as a dump of a town just minutes ago. Cole Bryson, what the hell are you doing? Listen, guys. In the morning, you know how sometimes you just have like these epiphanies, right? What if they made water that had Advil already in it? That way you don't have to take Advil with your water. You ever had Diesel. one of those mornings where you you ever had one of those mornings where you wake up and need water and Advil the first thing you need? Uh <laughs> Yes, but my, my my thing here is I know that Cole Bryson's not a NASCAR fan, Diesel, because he's never heard of BC Powder before. It's Goody Powder. Thank you very much. Goody I mean, powder, powder for the way. Like, look, are we going to start a whole new debate on this station instead of Hellman's mayonnaise, which I know that Cole Bryson eats Hellman's mayonnaise, not Duke's mayonnaise. Hellman's uh, is not real mayo. But, uh, are we going to start? Are we really going to start the Duke's? Uh, the excuse me, the BC and the Goody Powder debate. I mean, listen, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a NASCAR guy. It's ingrained in me. What do you want, Diesel? It, it's, 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 it's from, it's from birth. Hey, I'm a wuss. I need the orange flavored powders because they go down so much smoother. Wait, wait, wait. Let's start with this. We are sitting here arguing about flavored powders when Cole's, Cole's over here telling us swallowing a Tylenol is too tough. Yeah, what, what's in that? What's in that cup? Is that vodka here at uh, nine ten in the morning, Cole Bryson? It's the water. H two O Diesel. H two O. Sad hair of the dog, buddy. Hair of the dog. Go for it. <laughs> Cole and Diesel moving into the 3 to 7 p.m. slot starting next Monday with their new show, Wire Number Two Wire, which is, I'm sorry, what I'm going to call it from now on. Um, hashtag branding. CB, my man. Uh, congratulations, Diesel. Congratulations. What a move for the boys. Listen, man, we're excited. Diesel and I have probably worked together. I think he kept count, but I think we've probably worked together maybe a dozen or so times um, over the past few years. And we've always, you know, we've always hit it off, not to get romantic here on a uh, Friday morning, but we've always hit it off and uh, we've always had good chemistry. And uh, listen, man, uh, Diesel and I may agree on some things, but there may be more than uh, more than that that we disagree on. So we're excited to uh, bring continue to bring it each and every weekday. Uh, I couldn't be more excited to, to do the show with Diesel um, and tell him how wrong he is every day from three to seven. Hey, my, my wife tells me that every night. She tells me that every morning before she leaves, she comes and gives me a little kiss on the forehead, says you're wrong, have a good day. Why should this be any different? Uh, I'm sad that we didn't yeah. cue up Careless Whisper there when you were talking about the bromance that's forming on this very show, on this very station coming up at uh, 3 o'clock every afternoon on the Fan Upstate. This is going to be a blast, man. We are going to go at each other. We are going to go at the Clemson Tigers. We're going to go at the South Carolina Gamecocks. Look, nothing is going to change. The listener uh, around here has come to know and learn that these programs make mistakes. 
and we have to be willing to call them and take them to the mat for their mistakes. And nothing about that is going to change. Uh, you know, my, my, my favorite thing is that if there's one word I would use to describe Cole Bryson, it's combative. <laughs> is that a good thing? Uh, it's not even a true thing, Cole Bryson. I was completely BSing. I am really excited to hear the first angry Cole v. angry Diesel debate. I'm locked in. Cole, is your hey, phone dropping quick, frames guys, or does that just how your face looks? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I may have bad service. I apologize. Yeah, Diesel, he may have bad service. It's uh, yeah, definitely not the fact that I feel like I'm watching a 1962 VHS home movie edition of Cole Bryson. Yeah, it's the up-the-nose shot in four frames per second. That's what I'm really excited you, for. On you this are kind of going full boomer on us right now, Cole Bryson. That is correct. I love what is buddy. boomer? What do I you love mean by that? The composition matters. You got to hold the camera up here, pal. Hey, See? look, speaking of that, guys, I'm in this hotel trying to be quiet, which I'm not doing. I found uh, South Carolina's team meeting room after last night's game. Wow, the empty bar. Shot, um, shots fired. It could shots serve fired. as their Shot, uh, wait, wait, trophy wait, 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 Diesel. Wait, 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 wait. Are you going to go shots fired like you didn't immediately pop up a video where you told Gamecock fans that, and I quote, Oregon is your daddy, end quote? Uh, explain to me how that's not accurate. They they snagged Jordan Burch. It's not away. accurate. It's they not accurate. Kuzinar they beat him one time. And people. then Cousinard, the former Gamecock, puts up 40 on you. He absolutely smoked you. He almost beat you by himself, okay? Oregon is South Carolina's daddy. Explain to me how I'm wrong. You can't. Listen, Mark Ryan paid Diesel to continue to say things like that. I saw it happen. I saw the <laughs> Not enough. Up. I can promise you that. Not enough. I don't Okay, I have to say, when you guys are talking about who's your daddy, I can see you guys with that um, Mario, what is it, uh, Pedro Martinez saying, call the Yankees my daddy. I can see you guys seeing the who's your daddy. They're, they beat them one time, Diesel. It's not like they beat them 10 days in a row. Well, they, they snagged two of their elite players, okay? Look, uh, I, I know you know this, Cole. There is competition on and off the field. All of it matters. Yes. Don't be one of these dudes that says, well, outside of, this, outside of the 12 games they play, the other, I'm bad at math, 353 days a year don't matter. So, 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 let me so, they didn't have a, so they didn't have a good season? I mean, you can't say they had a good season? We're not talking about their season. We're talking about Oregon, South Carolina. If, if we're well, going to start said, straw man arguments day. here, see, see, Cole Bryson, you are, uh, you are guilty right here already on the station. You're guilty of creating straw man arguments, and we will not allow that on wire to wire. On wire to wire, you argue the point, you stay on point, because if you go off road, you're automatically admitting that you're wrong and you don't but know what you're no talking fun. about because you cannot stay on point. But that's no fun. <laughs> but this is another way for me to tell you that you're wrong. See, you got to stay on point. I mean, yeah, they got beat. Like, they got beaten. It wasn't close. I get it. I, I watched most of the game. But, like, at some point, you just got to tip your hat to Oregon. Like, they were they were the much better team. I don't, you know, I don't know. If, if they play ten times, I don't know if Carolina wins, like, two times. Look, Cole, I mean, if you're going to do this, you might as well go ahead and get on your knees now if you're going to start sucking up to the Gamecocks this much. I'm just being honest, man. I'm being honest. Uh, yeah. Do you think South Carolina could have beat Oregon five times if they played ten times or no? Four times, maybe. BJ, Four times, BJ, maybe. BJ Mack didn't hit a shot for the first, like, three days, wasn't it? I mean, how long did he go without a field goal? Hey, if you got a program where your best players don't show up, you are unlikely to be successful. All right, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I'm going to I'm going to jump in here for a number of reasons, not the least of which is I think you guys are missing a couple of things. Uh number 1, the new objective for South Carolina is set. You have to find a 5 this offseason. Every game that you got beat, you got beat by a big man. Dante yesterday was just playing next level basketball and South Carolina had no answer. 
And as far as Kuzinar goes, look, South Carolina didn't do anything wrong. I don't know about you guys. Moving on from Frank Martin was the right decision at the time. The problem is Jermaine Kuzinar was a Frank Martin guy. And if we have the portal and you For leave sure. because you, as I've said on this show many times, guys, players don't play for programs anymore. They don't play for logos anymore. They don't play for school pride. We're past that. Players play for coaches, cultures, and cash, the three C's of college sports. When Frank Martin was gone, the coach, and when Frank Martin's culture was gone, the culture, and when Oregon, a team backed by Phil Knight, there's the cash, all check down the three C's. South Carolina didn't do anything wrong, Diesel. Oregon didn't didn't do anything specifically to beat Carolina that they couldn't have done to any other school. It was just the wrong place, wrong time. Yeah, the loss stung yesterday, but I'm going to go with Cole on this one in that this is a season to be celebrated, even if the loss was a crap one, because if Dante's not hurt for about 13 games this year, the Oregon Ducks are a lock for the tournament instead of winning to get in. I think a lot of people saw the 11 seed and got confused. Oregon was five seed, six seed good when they were at full strength. Yeah, but South Carolina was a it was a top 15 program for a good part of this season. Uh, I, I'm not going to allow anyone to to, uh, to to paint me into a corner and say that in my video, I did not say that you just had a fantastic season. You had an elite level season, top 15 program in the country, and the damn wheels fell off over the past two weeks for the South Carolina Gamecocks. I wouldn't say they fell off for the past two weeks because, South, listen, they, the wheels fell off for Clemson. Bro. South Carolina was at least, you know, they were at least playing with teams. Clemson, Clemson's the one that the wheels fell off, I feel like. I'm not, I'm not arguing there. Not arguing there. Clemson fans have been telling us for the past but, uh, for the for the past three months that they were waiting for the other shoe to drop, for the waiting for the wheels to fall off. That is I'm that, not arguing that at all. But guys, let's let's ask this question. What does that really matter though? Because like we we just saw last night, Kentucky was playing better basketball than anybody, really. I mean, especially of down the stretch, Kentucky was playing some of the best basketball. And and when you get into the tournament, it's about styles and matchups. And you saw last night that Kentucky just had a a, a dog fight with a, a with a team, a style that they really weren't uh, used to. So, you know, Coach Cal talked about it on our station a couple of days ago and how that Oakland, uh, their zone defense was going to bring a style that was going to be tough for his guys. But what I know we say this all the time for MLB and NBA. I don't want to say the regular season doesn't matter, but we saw a team with, with Kentucky who was playing really good, and then they're bouncing the first round because of a different style. So does does how you're playing down the stretch really mean as much as we think? Let's uh, let's Look, do this. I, let's do this. I, will, I will fight you on the style argument forever. These schools, Kentucky has – Five stars littered all over that campus. They've got a tremendous, tremendous gargantuan resource advantage. Kentucky has every single advantage. The only thing they didn't have was Ray Zelensky, the auto parts king, on the court, and Oakland ripped them apart with that guy. Yeah, and if you have a seven-game series, Kentucky probably wins, right? But, but this is not this is not about seven-game series. This is a one-game right. series. That's what I'm saying. So styles do matter because all you got to do is beat them one time. Let's do this, fellas. We are up on it. Stick around. We're going to have Diesel and Cole stick around for another segment. I'm not asking if they can. I'm telling them they will because this is promotion time. The boys got a new show. It starts on Monday from 3 to 7 p.m. It's Wire number 2 Wire with Cole Bryson and Diesel. We got to take a break. We come back. We will talk a little bit about that show, the direction of the show, what you guys can expect to hear from the show. We'll do that when we come back. It's the Rob Brown Show with Diesel and Cole on the Fan Upstate. Hey, my computer's making me want to throw a restart real quick. I'll do this. I'll be right back. Yep. He lied. He's not coming back. Did you just find a random ass couch to lay down on during the break? I did. I've never been more proud of you. Heck yeah, man. Right. 
We're going to step away for 30 seconds, guys. We'll be right back with Diesel and Cole. Hold tight. Cole. Yo. I love your name. <laughs> your you mom. Like that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's really professional, isn't it? It's very grown up of you. What uh what uh what stream yard meeting were you in that you 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 popped your name up as your mom? You talking to me? Yeah, I'm talking. No, I'm talking to the other guy in the stream yard whose name is your mom. <laughs> what was the question? What kind of meet? What kind of stream yard were you doing that you changed your name to your mom, or did you just do that? No, I did it when I came in the first time. Beautiful. What are you doing in Louisville? Work? Yeah, it's a work conference. It's bullshit. Yeah. You know how you just have to sit through these things. Uh, we are we are we are streaming public to the world, FYI. I'm trying to figure out this Catholic church right here, Diesel. I'm trying to figure out if they have church on Friday or if it's homeless people. I think it's home. Big 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 Lou. Lou. On your new $1 million policy. Remember, call Big Lou. He's $1 million. He's only on number two. Because he's only on the number two. $68.98. That's $800. $700. million. For a million dollars in term life insurance that you can live with. Call Big Lou at 800-768-98. 800-768-98. So there's a big COVID outbreak up there now. Is that right? Yes, the government will soon begin providing fast, guaranteed settlements to Camp Lejeune, Marines, families, and civilians. Awards will range between one hundred and five hundred fifty. Yes, we're 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 ignoring you because we're in public right now. Camp Lejeune and suffer cancers of the bladder. Oh, I'm sorry. Leukemia, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, Parkinson's, or kidney issues. You may be entitled to a significant financial reward for your Camp Lejeune claim, and could be paid within sixty days after accepting your settlement with your VA benefits fully protected. Did you guys see this dude whose tweet went massively viral after the uh, Kentucky loss? He, uh, at Kenny Fair 3 on Twitter, if Calipari is allowed back in Lexington, I will make January 6th look like a kindergarten birthday party. And uh, apparently thousands of people have been tagging the FBI in that tweet. Yeah. He, uh, oh, God. <laughs> He's like, he's like every dumb tweet I've ever sent, and this is the one that goes viral. 30 seconds. But is there anything wrong with that? Like, I, don't think, I don't see anything wrong. It's technically a threat. Ten seconds. Ballot 318 through 329. While supplies last, selection varies by location. Sound off on the text line. 71307. Keyword fan. You're listening to the Rob Brown Show. Only on the fan. Upstate. The Rob Brown Show back on your radio. It is the fan upstate inside the final half hour of the radio broadcast. And for... At least a few more minutes, ladies and gentlemen. We are joined here on the show by the host 
of the brand new show that will start this upcoming Monday from 3 to 7 right here and only every single weekday on the Fan Upstate is Wire to Wire with Diesel and Cole. We got Cole Bryson. We got Diesel on the show with us today to let you guys know a little bit about what is going to happen starting on Monday and continuing until one of them assaults the other in public. I'm looking forward to it. You guys should as well. Uh, look, I want to get back to the basketball, maybe talk a little Carolina Panthers if we have time before we get out of here, fellas. But uh, take a second. I'll let both of you give it a run. Take a second and just let people know what they can expect out of uh, Wire to Wire when it starts up on Monday. Yeah, Ladies I'll take first. this first. Uh, yeah, Wire to Wire. Man, this is going to be a high-octane, high-energy, spark plug type of show. Uh, you know, our intention is is to, to throw it at the listeners each and every day, each and every segment. Look, Cole and I, we've done a lot of radio together. Uh, he and I uh, have such a fantastic rapport, and I, I, I truly believe that's why uh, Mark Hendricks put us together on this show. You've got now two host-caliber talents on this show, and we both have the ability to rip it up, chop it up, and throw it back and forth at each other. And ultimately, that's what everybody's here for, right? Everybody is here to be entertained. We are Maximus Decimus Meridius, and we are asking, are you not entertained? That is what this show is going to be. Uh, it's the it's wire the number two wire wire to wire that's what this show is all about. And to echo what Diesel said, like we know that afternoon drive, a lot of people are going home, picking up their kid, whatever it is, right? But our goal is to provide such an entertaining show, such a high quality show, such a fast paced. Um, radio program that people have no choice but to listen wire to wire front to back beginning to end and uh i couldn't be more excited to start is it this monday guys do i have to get back like is it three days away is that right yes listen listen guy who opened by saying hi guys it's a struggle i'm at the omni right now and i'm having a hard time fi shut up cole yes you have to come back to work on monday all right, I'll be there Monday. That's that's I, look good enough for me. I only have to listen from three to seven. My day is way over at that point. Uh, very much looking forward to it. Uh, it has been. Uh, it's obviously been. It, 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 I've had the opportunity to work with both of you guys in different capacities. Cole and I uh, have done some high school football, and he's filled in on this show when Lonzo's out. Uh, obviously, uh, History of the Station, Diesel and I started together on a show before we shifted time slots and moved around a little bit. I've had the chance to work with both of you guys, and as the most friendly, affable, lovable, charismatic person in both of your lives right now, uh, I'm really intrigued because both of you guys... And I think it's part of the part of the part of the role we play in doing this. But both of you guys tend to have some real solid, real strong opinions, and very rarely do they seem to line up with each other. So, uh, how's that gonna go? Well, you know when you stick your tongue on a nine volt battery, Rob. That's what this is gonna go like. Ooh. For for, for the record, Diesel, no, I don't know deal? what that's like because I've never been tempted to lick a battery. <laughs> well, you should try it. You know, everybody should uh, everybody should ride the lightning once in their lives. I've been tased before, like not in a weird way. Like it was a, it was like a military training thing. Like not like I was walking down an alley and got tased. Kind time of out, thing. Time out, time out, time out. How would you describe being tased in a weird way? <laughs> I think he means in a sexual way. Yeah, that's what I was gonna huh. go with. But my mom listens to this show, so I got to. And this show is G-rated, sir. Sorry, I apologize. No, it's all good. It's a, Listen, it's a very valid question. And as soon as I said it, I immediately regretted it. So I, I, I appreciate you making it a point of emphasis, Cole. Thank you very much. Hey, listen, one other thing real quick. You know what? Our listeners, their mornings will be better when they tune into the Rob Brown Show. And your listeners, their afternoons will be better when they tune into Wire to Wire. Our goal, man, is to not only bring a... Uh, electric compelling program but to play off of each other as much as possible because uh i don't know if anybody knows this or not but we're all on the same team right so uh, our goal is to play off of each other have each other on our programs as well you you and lonzo uh diesel and i 
and uh, make this thing the best it's ever been. No, I agree entirely. I was going to say, I can't tell if Diesel's frozen or if he's just so bored that he went catatonic on us there for a second. Well, he was talking about you. I figured you would take the opportunity oh, to okay. jump in and talk okay. about you because you love you more than anybody. As T.O. once said, I love me some me, baby. I thought my uh, screen Speaking froze. of, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's set him up here for a second, Diesel. Let's see how Cole Bryson takes the reins. Um, the Dallas Cowboys, Cole, uh, are hilarious oh, right now to me. They're hilarious to me right now. Like, the funniest thing is Steven, baby Jerry, hitting you with the, we're all in, we're all in, and then doing absolutely and precisely nothing. Are you silver lining or are you joining the rest of American sports fans and realizing that your ownership sucks still? Oh my gosh. Um, how long do we have? Like the answer to the question. Yes. I mean, here's the problem before that statement was made, they were on a, the, the setting was they were on uh, Jerry's bus. The media got on the bus. It was three or four media members and somebody asked them if they were going to be all in during the off season. Right. Well, Jerry's response was the first thing he said was, what does all in mean? Everybody has a def different definition of all in. So again, that's his cop out. That's his way of already letting you know that regardless of what he does, he can justify it to what he wants to, the way he wants to spin it, right? Um, he, he, Rob, I would love to say that I'm surprised, but I've been dealing with this for 27 years. Like, nothing surprises me anymore. Like, if they just went on a, went on their yacht and said, we'll see you suckers in August, it wouldn't surprise me, man. Wait a minute. Is, is Jerry Jones just straight ripping everything from the Clemson program off? All in is a Clemson thing. The bus, why, did, why don't he just go ahead and call it the Roy bus while he's at it? And now he's changing the definitions of words like best is the standard. I mean, come on. Come on, Jerry Jones. You're rich enough. At least at least spring for the paid version of chat GPT and come up with something better than all of those things Clemson's already using. Hey, Diesel, I got a question for you. So with the new show coming around, just kind of give uh, the, the listeners a little brief rundown of what to expect. I know you've kind of touched a little bit about it, but give a little more like in-depth about what Wire to Wire will be like. Is it going to be fast-paced, in-your-face kind of thing, like a get-up kind of show? Or some, just give us a little details of what you and uh, Cole are going to give uh, the listeners to listen to. Well, yeah, it, it is going to be a fast-paced show because, uh, because um, you know, Cole and I are both – uh, not to uh, not to look into the trash can in the studio at the uh, at the radio station, but we are we are monster energy drink personified. We are uh, two high energy guys, and our goal here is to talk everything that the audience cares about. So where the show previously was lacking in Braves coverage, we're, we got Braves coverage. Where the show was previously lacking a little bit in Panthers coverage, we're going to hit Panthers coverage. We're going to hit Falcons coverage. We're going to hit. Uh, master's coverage more than we ever have on this station before. So our goal, uh, just like the just like the phrase means, wire to wire, like when a basketball team scores the first bucket of a game and they end up winning the game, our goal is to cover everything that the audience cares about. Okay, hang on, hang on. One rootin' tootin', gosh darn second here. Um, How many monster cans things... are in your trash can right now, Rob? Well, first off, they're not in my trash can. I'm literally holding it still. I haven't I haven't finished this <laughs> one yet. Placement. Second off, uh, one of the things that I can tell you I'm excited about is what Cole just mentioned a second ago. Uh, the other day after the announcement got made, the three of us stood in the studio for a little while and we talked a little bit because obviously we all have a, a vested interest and influence in the direction that the station goes moving forward. And we all said, the same thing, which is we want the shows to be separate shows, but intertwined. They are their own identities. They have their own identities, but they also work together. I want you guys on the Rob Brown show to talk about stuff. I'm going to come on wire to wire to talk about stuff. And that's all well and good. But Diesel, did you just tell me that 
you are going to bring more Masters coverage to the show, to the station than ever before, because you know I still work here, right? No, I'm talking about our day part, our show. Oh, got it. Okay. Uh, the, the previous show that I was a part of, we we didn't touch on golf except for when it intersected and, uh, and, and ruffled the feathers as far as live golf is concerned. And look, there is some there is meat on that bone. Trust me, there is meat on that bone. But that can't be the only reason that you cover golf. Otherwise, it gets tiresome. Good. I look forward to my invitation to come on and talk Masters with you uh, because it is in just a couple of weeks. And Diesel, and this is what I'm excited about, Cole, to come on your show and talk about because I know the invitation will be extended. Cole, Masters weekend and WrestleMania are on the same weekend this year, pal. You know, is it bad that when you say Masters, the first thing I think about is those pimento cheese sandwiches they, they sell? No. No, there's nothing that wrong with that. Thing? They're delicious. Listen, you know what? I, I am excited because I will admit, I'll admit this. I'm not a golf guy, right? Um, however, our audience, there are plenty of people in our audience that are golf guys, right? And uh, I, I think that it does deserve the coverage. And for those that care, I think that Diesel and I will obviously cover it, but we will let them be a part of the show in a way where I don't want to make it sound like they're hosting a segment, but we want them to have a voice as well. So uh, while our show is going to be energetic, high paced, as Diesel has said, it is also going to be a way for our audience to feel like they have a voice and uh, we're going to let them be involved and we want it to be uh, very, very interactive and continue that. Um, I feel like the show already did a good job of that, but we want to continue that as well. Diesel, I, I like that. You and I have talked about this for a while. Part of the reason that we have put in the work we've built in to build up the stream to make sure that we're present across social media platforms, et cetera, is because we, everybody here at the Fan Upstate, like we call ourselves the voice of the Upstate sports fan for a reason. We don't call it the voice to the Upstate sports fan, the voice at the Upstate sports fan. It is the voice of because we do it here on this show. I know you guys are going to do it on yours. We want you to be a part of it. We want the listener to be involved. We want the listener to not just feel like I'm going to tune in to hear what Diesel and Cole have to say, or I'm going to tune in to hear what Rob Brown has to say. The stream comments are always up on this show. The Twitter is always up on our show, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So to me... The fact that you guys are going to go out of your way to make sure that there is, and, and I know that it's always been this way with offsides, but the the continued interaction with the upstate fans, like, that's great. That's what we should have. Yeah, I mean, I give, um, I give Mark Ryan a ton of credit. Mark Ryan and yourself both a ton of credit uh, because it's not something that happened just over the last year or the last two years or the last three years. The community that this station has built – I think it would be the envy of a lot of radio stations across this country. We have dedicated diehard P1s who listen to both of our shows each and every day. And they are in that comment section. They are picking up the phone every single day. And I just want all the all the listeners who know uh, to know that we value that more than they can understand. Diesel and Cole Brightwell. Cole left because he's at the Omni. And nah, 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 nah. He'll be back. <laughs> maybe he will. Maybe he won't. You got to go fill know. that glass with something else. Something. Yeah. It's definitely water. My man woke up, jumped on the stream, and immediately asked about the best way to ingest aspirin, but it was totally just water in that cup. Okay, Cole, for sure. Uh, wire to wire with Diesel and Cole. Starts on Monday. It will air every weekday from 3 to 7. Diesel, we got to go. Uh, do us a favor. Give us a sample. Take us to break in the way that only Diesel can. <laughs> well, hey, I tell you what. We're going to do something that's going to surprise people. The way we go to break. We are not going to do this long, drawn out. Give us a call. We're going to break. Shoot us a text. Find our email. 
No, we are going to keep you on your toes. We're going to keep you on your toes for when we toss to these ad breaks. You know why? Because we believe in not wasting your time. So you know what? We just up and... Yeah, he left. <laughs> he just he just he just left. He just left. Oh. What a diva move. I'm calling him Diva Soul from now on. Wire to wire starts on Monday, three to seven, every weekday with Diesel and Cole Bryson. Brother, congratulations again, man. I'm stoked for you guys. Can't You're wait to listen excited. on Monday. Yeah, man. We're excited. I appreciate you, Rob Brown, for all of your support. You, Brandon, for your uh what is it now? A year and a half of hard work at the radio station. Yep, year and a half, man. You know a big dog. Let's Let's get it, Diesel. Diesel. Well done. All right. We got to run to a break. We're going to come back. I'm going to give you my best bets and picks for the college bracket today. Clemson taking on New Mexico. They are dogs in this one. Already laid out the secret sauce of what they need to do to win. I'll tell you if they will. When we come back, it's Rob. It's Brandon filling in for Lonzo. Diesel and Cole start on Monday, 3 to 7. We... Start again in like four minutes. Don't go anywhere. It's the Rob Brown Show. It's the Fan Up State. <laughs> oh, Rob, I appreciate you bringing me on. Uh, Texter wants to know if uh, if I was going to talk wrestling on the show. No. Te- come on, guys. Come on, guys. We Real sports only, okay? We'll leave the, the kids' sports to the Rob Brown Show. Uh, the great news is that I know Cole Bryson is too nice of a guy to hang up on collars. So when he's working the phones, I'm not saying Jim Bob from Picking County going to call in to talk some WrestleMania, but Jim Bob from Picking County might call in and talk some WrestleMania is all I'm saying, Diesel. <laughs> Rob, I appreciate you having me on the show today, man. You know this what, is buddy? A blast Congratulations and... again. I look forward to hearing you Thank guys you so Monday, much. man. Thank you so much. You guys have a all good right, afternoon enjoy the games see y'all see diesel there you go there's diesel and cole cole got kicked and then he was like eh, screw it i don't need to, don't need to <laughs> they got they got the gist of it And now I got to go clean out my comments because he said we'll cover real sports only. And it went on to my Facebook profile where yeah, like we five absolutely of them. talk wrestling. Doesn't matter the outcome. Clemson still lasted longer the tournament than SC. Now call Will Wade, you cowers. <laughs> hey, uh, Rob. Yeah. Thanks for letting me host you this week, man. I appreciate it, bud. Thanks for coming in, man. I had a blast. You have a minute and a half. Beautiful. that's kind of about like when stella does she starts barking randomly out of the blue no somebody just knocked uh somebody just knocked something over outside oh when someone like oh when a uh, ups truck comes to our neighborhood stella's like what is that what is that yep. yeah 20 seconds remy 
Anybody want a free dog? <laughs> All right, 10 seconds. All right, ladies and gentlemen, er, wrapping up the broadcast here on the Rob Brown Show, here on the Fan Upstate. One last look up and down today's brackets because we've got some teams in action. UConn and Stetson today. I don't think UConn's going to have too much of a problem. They are like a 30-point favorite in this game. So I think, I think that this tournament is likely not going to see the 16-1 upset, though we do have only one that's played so far, North Carolina and Wagner. Purdue and Grambling play tonight at 7:15. Houston and Longwood at 9:20. UConn and Stetson at 2:45. Uh, best game of the day, I think FAU Northwestern is going to be a good one. I am actually shocked how far apart the line is for San Diego State UAB. I looked that up a little while ago. San Diego State is listed at like a 13. Last I saw and it could be could be different now. In fact, I'll go ahead and pull it up uh on the uh on BetQL and BetMGM. Uh San Diego State, okay, it is at 7 points in that one, which I think is is reasonable. I actually like UAB with the cover there. Uh just very similar to the reasons that I like the upset with Stanford last night. Uh, excuse me, with Sanford last night. They play a style of ball that is hectic. San Diego State has one of, if not the best defenses in all of college basketball. UAB uh, is a is a is a patient team, but they're a quick team. Patient but quick. So I'm intrigued by that. Uh, Auburn takes on Yale today at 4:15. I've already told you. Auburn is my national championship selection this year. I got the War Eagle Tigers cutting down the nets when this tournament comes to its conclusion in a couple of weeks. So I like Auburn over Yale today. Uh, over on the other side, out of the South region, Houston takes on Longwood. We have already told you uh, Oral Roberts has won from this spot. Farley Dickinson has won from this spot. Uh or, or uh, excuse me, uh, Longwood adding to the phallic connotations. If they can get the win over Houston, they won't. Houston by a million today. I also yeah. like Nebraska over a And M. And by the way, I think at this point we can, with what happened to Mississippi State, with what happened to Kentucky, what would happen to South Carolina yesterday. I got to tell you, I'm a little less confident now in my pick of Auburn, a little less confident now in my pick of Alabama all the way to the Sweet 16 because all of a sudden it looks like maybe the SEC was just a little overrated. Maybe it looks like the SEC did what so many fans have accused them of doing in football for so many years, which is basically just beating up on each other and nobody else, all of the sudden, Clemson knocking off Alabama, maybe it doesn't look as valuable of a win as maybe it should have in years or in, in, in months gone by because the SEC is very, very, very front and center on the struggle bus in this tournament right now. Hey, Rob. So give, can you give us your Cinderella pick for today, please? Because I'm eager to hear this. Uh, I'm going to tell you, I like James Madison over Wisconsin out of the 12-5 matchup. I think James Madison's got a uh, very underappreciated team. And I think, frankly, Wisconsin probably burned through a lot of their rocket fuel running through their conference tournament. So I like Wisconsin down there. Um, I got to tell you, I'm, uh, I picked NC State to win out right yesterday. I'm picking NC State to beat Oakland. I've got NCAA, NC State in the Sweet 16 and I'm feeling real, real good about that pick. Uh, I like Florida today over Colorado. It's not an upset. Florida the 17, Colorado the 10. But there's been a lot of hype following the Buffaloes 
uh, over the last couple of weeks running through their conference tournament. Listen, Florida's a good team. Todd Golden is a good coach. Florida's a hectic team. And on top of that, I don't think it's going to last more than one game. But Florida's got that emotional edge, right? They got their boy sitting in the hospital with the shattered leg bone. They got somebody to play for today. Uh, Purdue's going to beat Grambling State by 1,000 later today. I do like Utah State over TCU. Uh, I am going Clemson over New Mexico, both in the bracket and on the money line bet. I, I, you're getting plus money for a team that's got a good a uh, versus top 25 record as anybody else in all of college basketball. And you're telling me that the way that you beat New Mexico is by utilizing your inside players and then you're giving me P.J. Hall? Give me Clemson to win over New Mexico today as well. I like Alabama over Charleston and the cover. Uh, I like St. Mary's over GCU. Grand Canyon feels like one of those teams that people are trying to force into the Cinderella role. You do not force a team into the Cinderella role. They either take it and run with it like the Oakland Golden Grizzlies did last night, or they don't. St. Mary's going to knock off Grand Canyon today. And then uh, I think that's uh, I think that's the matchups. I got Auburn over Yale, San Diego State falls to UAB in a 5-12 upset. Actually, I got 5-12 upsets in both of those games today. I'm taking the 12 UAB over San Diego State. I'm taking the 12 James Madison over Wisconsin. There's my favorite picks of the day, big dog. Yes, sir. Good picks, man. I, I, I My team that I'm watching tonight, I'm going to say, is Grand Canyon. I feel like Grand Canyon can pull the upset over St. Mary's. Uh, you nailed uh, you nailed the one yesterday. We'll see if he sticks <laughs> with it uh, with the success today. Brandon, great job this week, man. I appreciate. I mean, I really appreciate getting to work with work, you, man. Pal. I had a blast, man. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, thank all you guys for sticking around, for listening, for hanging out with us all week long. I hope you enjoy today's first round games in the bracket. When we get back on Monday, we'll obviously take a very deep look at what happens today and tomorrow, and Sunday, and Monday, and Tuesday, because we roll right into the second round. Basketball is just the best, you guys. Thank you very much for listening. Lonzo will rejoin us coming up on Monday's edition of the show, uh, and it's basketball heavy throughout the rest of the tournament. I appreciate you guys being here. Bet for the Cycle airs tomorrow from 10, or excuse me, from noon to 4, on the BetQL Network, myself, former MLB player Cody Decker, executive producer Hate Nass Mario. We'll be lined up for you tomorrow, noon to four on the BetQL Network. You can find us on Twitch, on YouTube, or on the Odyssey app. Then on Sunday, from nine until noon, I will be filling in for Sean Marash on BetQL's Five Star Weekend. That is going to air from 9 to noon on Sunday because, honestly, who the hell needs a day off? So, noon to 4 tomorrow on the Beck QL Network, 9 to noon on Sunday. And then we are back in the saddle on Monday morning for Brandon, for Lonzo, for Diesel and Cole. Congrats on the new show, boys. Wire to Wire with Cole and Diesel starts on Monday, 3 to 7 every weekday. To all of you, from all of us, hearts, we love you. Thanks for being here. Have a fantastic weekend. Drew not drink and drive. I will punch you in the face. And we'll see you back here on Monday for another rousing edition of the Rob Brown Show and the Fan Upstate. Yeah! You're listening to the Rob Brown Show. Let the game come to you. No matter where you go. In Anderson, Clemson, Greenville, and Spartanburg. Always streaming wherever you are on the Odyssey app. Make the Fan Upstate a favorite. Unique and unlike any other sports talk show, it's Bad MGM Tonight, Monday through Friday from 7 to 11, only on the fan. Upstate. Bad MGM Tonight is the red zone for Brandon, casual and hardcore the, sports uh, fans. Live sports betting updates for single. all of the night's games as they happen. Get the latest scores, sides, totals, props, parlays, futures, and... Thank you, sir. Is yes, there... All right, man. Thank you very much. Good week this week. Appreciate it. Thanks, buddy. I really appreciate it, man. You have a good weekend, all right? You as well. To everybody out there in Sportslandia, you're all spectacular people. I appreciate you being here. I hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, should be back in the studio on Monday. I will let you know when we get an update. Uh, if anybody is out and about this weekend uh, watching basketball, 
holler at your boy. I will be somewhere most of the time that I'm not on the radio. Y'all have a great weekend. Thank you for watching. See you later. Goodbye. Adios.